Good evening, I am Marcia Wasserman, Mid-Atlantic Region President, and on behalf of my executive team and Board of Directors, I welcome you to our Zoom training program. In attendance tonight is our International Women's League President, Debbie Goldich. She will give her personal greetings and, are, and we are delighted that she is able to be with us tonight. Also in attendance is Margie Miller, immediate past International Women's League president and the Mid-Atlantic region has had the honor of working with Margie as our advisor. I am thrilled that so many members of Garden State region, our sisters to our North are able to join us tonight, including Glenette Cedar, Garden State region president, Eileen Rothman, past Garden State region president, and Susan Romanoff, Garden State Region Tora Fund Vice President. We look forward to the opportunity to get to know all of you and to learn with you. A special shout out to Jeanette Brownstein, my sister pre pre co -pre president in the Florida Region President. At our last, but certainly not least, welcome to our past Region Presidents, officers, and international officers who continue to support the Mid-Atlantic region and the other regions. Our co-chairs <clears throat> for tonight's event are Karen Cooker, Mid-Atlantic Region Ways and Means Vice President, and Susie Markowitz, our Region Secretary. Thank you and your talented committee for all the work that you have done to make tonight a success. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Terry Hartman, who will be doing our Devorah Torah. Terry Hartman is a member of both Adith Israel in, on the main line and Shirak Hagam in Vetner, New Jersey. Affiliates will deliver the Devorah, as I just said. Terry has long been an advocate and supporter of our conservative Masorti movement. In fact, she is the mother of a rabbi a cantor, and her daughter-in-law is both a rabbi and a cantor. All were ordained, ordained at our Jewish Theological Seminary. We look forward to her inspiring words. Terry, it's all yours. Wow, thanks, Marcia. Um, I really appreciate it, and I feel honored that uh, Susie asked me to do this tonight and, and that she has so much confidence in, in, in me. Um, the inspiration for the Devar that I'm going to talk about comes from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who many of you know was the uh, chief rabbi of the UK. So this week's Parsha is Balak. Uh, it, this portion is noted for its tale of talking donkeys, who see God, and the Israelites uh, taking on the ways of its neighbors once again. While it's called Balak, after the king of Moab, who feared the Israelites, it mostly centers on Baalam, a diviner who sees the future. Baalam was kind of a prophet for hire, not attached to any particular people. Balak hired him to curse the Israelites so that perhaps he could defeat them. God talks to Baalam twice and tells them to bless the Jewish people instead, which he does much to Balak's consternation. It's interesting to note that there is evidence that Baalam actually existed. There were some excavations done in 1967, and they found some references to Baalam, very much like the story in the Torah from a pagan temple in the 8th century BCE. He's also one of the few prophets that actually God talks to and even gives a second chance when he doesn't listen the first time, and he was not from the Jewish people. Some of the rabbinic literature even suggests that Baalam was as great a prophet as Moses. Yet Baalam doesn't fare too well in the Torah. Towards the end of this parsha, he leads the Israelites astray, suggesting that they take on the rituals of the Moabites, which ended up with disastrous results. Even his name, Baalam, means man without a people, a prophet for profit, if you will. So what are the lessons that can be learned here 
Perhaps it is that talent can only take you so far. I'm fortunate to be on this call with so many of skilled and talented women from the Mid-Atlantic region. But you're here not just because of your skills. Unlike Ba'alam, you are joined to a people, in this case, sisterhood, and demonstrate the qualities of honesty, integrity, and a willingness to do what is right. You are true leaders for Women's League. And for these reasons, it is my wish for you that you will be successful in your endeavors and take the Mid-Atlantic regions to new and greater heights. So mazel tov to you all and have a successful training. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much for that interesting and inspiring message. I am Karen Cooker, a co-chair of tonight's event. Uh, and I'm also a proud member of the Adith Jasher and Women's Association Sisterhood. Tonight, the Mid-Atlantic region is delighted to welcome to our event, Women's League for Conservative Judaism International President, Debbie Kanner Goldich. Debbie has led our organization as president for the last two years and in the face of a global pandemic has actively, enthusiastically and unceasingly represented Women's League throughout North America and in the world. Those attuned to the study of history will note that only one other Women's League president had to cope with a global pandemic, and that was our founder, Matilda Schechter. Impressive company, and Matilda would be very pleased with Debbie. Mid-Atlantic region is also particularly proud of Debbie, who claims us as her native soil. She is a longtime member of this region, and among her many accomplishments, she is a past Mid-Atlantic region president. So let's welcome our dear friend, my dear friend, President Debbie Kanner Goldich. Thank you, Karen. It, it's great to have good friends. And um, Karen was my sisterhood president for many years and did a great job. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know what time zone. I'm in Arizona right now. Um, I've just come from a trip from Des Moines, Iowa, where I visited a sisterhood affiliate that celebrated their 103rd anniversary, um, affiliating with Women's League for Conservative Judaism. Then we went to Chicago, where we did a hotel site visit for convention 2023. And um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful week. I want to share with you that our office, our international office has moved. We are now in our new office. It's a wonderful location. It's a block and a half from Penn Station. We are just about unpacked and I hope that all of you will come and visit. Um, it's really a wonderful place. We are in a location with six other Jewish organizations and really feel part of a Jewish community of New York City. I do wanna share with you that the new calendar diary is out. Many of you have bought it. We have a new calendar diary this year that's a large planner size. I'm not sure if you can see um, with the virtual screen, it's hard to see it, but it is 11 by 14 and it's exactly the same as the small calendar diary, but it is a larger size for those of you who feel that you can't fill in all your activities in that little space. So it's $25, it's available as the smaller calendar diary is please consider buying it and supporting Women's League. It's a great fundraiser for us. I also wanna share with you that this week before I traveled, I was very, very lucky to receive the very first, and Shelly doesn't know this yet, the very first Torah Fund pin for the next campaign. It says Kazakh, and you can see underneath, I have my legacy medallion. It's it's beautiful. I was really pleased to wear it. I'm hoping you can, yeah. And uh, it is beautiful. And I will say that the pins are in the office and we are asking for volunteers to come to the Torah Fund office on August 16, 17 and 18 in New York and help us pack and send those pins out. So if you're gonna be in New York or you'd like to come to New York to the Torah Fund office, Get in touch with Shelly Swabenis and she will make arrangements for you to come and help pack the pins. Um, 
Women's League Week, our newsletter is coming out bi-weekly over the summer. Our staff is taking some vacation time and we felt that this was appropriate, that it doesn't come out every week, it comes out every other week. So don't worry if you don't get it next week, it came out today and we'll have a two week break, it'll come out in two weeks. I wanna to mention to you that um, bylaws have been updated. We know many new sisterhood presidents who are on with us tonight. Uh, are in the process of rewriting your bylaws. And please look on the website for the new updated bylaws on the sisterhood affiliate level, the region level, and the international level. I know that the regions are very busy with their calendar right now, and the sisterhoods are writing their calendars. And so we hope that you will um, please take notice of the region dates and the region events on your sisterhood calendars so that you don't plan anything that conflicts with the region dates. I know Marsha is gonna be sending out the region calendar very soon. So please take a look at those dates. And, and again, please try not to conflict with those dates. I want to congratulate Marsha and her exec committee on a wonderful first year and know that they will continue to go from strength to strength. I also want to welcome Garden State Region and um, to tell you that this is really the first time that I know of that two regions have um, together shared a summer training. So it's an interesting, um, interesting night for all of us and we'll see how it goes. And we're just very, very glad to welcome the members of Garden State Region leadership. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to take a few minutes, Marsha, and give some updates. And I look forward to visiting with all of you tonight. Good evening, good afternoon. I'm Susie Markowitz and I am the co-chair for tonight along with Karen. I am a proud member of Melrose B'nai Israel Emmanuel. I have been president previously and I am also a member of the Sisterhood of Adith Israel of the Main Line. Tonight I'm going to introduce Margie Miller who is the immediate past president, international past president of Women's League. She is currently our, the Mid-Atlantic Region's advisor. And we're able to ask her and get wonderful information for her as we need it. Margie will share some introductory remarks before our workshop. Margie. Thank you so much. I am always amused when a member of clergy speaks before the congregation about the benefits of belonging to a congregation. To me, it's the epitome of preaching to the choir. Of course, those sitting in the pews, no matter what faith, are the joiners. They are the believers. They are the active members. They get it. They understand the value of belonging. So for me to speak to all of you who understand the value of belonging to Sisterhood and Women's League, is again like preaching to the choir. You get it, you're all here. So why did you come? Well, hopefully to gain knowledge on the positions that you have so that you can achieve the goals that each of your positions has. I hope that none of you are chuckling to yourself now saying, oh my God, what goals? I have goals. That is something that we're certainly going to explore this evening. But the bigger picture to me is that most of our members, unfortunately, quite honestly, don't even know that they belong to Women's League and what that means to be part of. And every year, Debbie has done a fabulous job. And during COVID, we've had the advantage of being able to really program to people in their pajamas, but still there's, there's some disconnect. So yes, tonight, we're going to focus on four very specific areas so that you can do your job as well. But to me, the larger picture for this session is not just for you to go and, and learn what you're gonna learn, it's for you to go back to your sisterhoods and say that Women's League is there to support each and every one of them in the jobs that they have within the sisterhood. We're covering four areas tonight, but there are many other program and activities and tasks and jobs, whatever you call them, that women have in your sisterhoods and none of them should be doing those jobs without the support of Women's League, whether that's at the regional level or the international level. That's the big sell. That's the value proposition. 
So Women's League's tagline, if you don't know it, you, you should, but you should, I'll tell it what it is. It's engaging, enriching, and empowering Jewish women. So to me, that's the bigger goal of this evening. Yes, we're here to train you on your positions so that you can do them well, of course. But to me also is to go back and to make sure that your sisterhoods um, really take advantage of all that we have. We are not covering, we're covering four areas, but think of all the areas that we're not covering tonight. Programming, fundraising, Israel, membership, school relationships, Judaica. And what we want you to do is to be our ambassadors and say, we got something really fabulous out of that hour and a half that we gave to that session. But each and every one of you, whatever you're doing in a sisterhood, has someone to help you along the way to make sure that they're doing their jobs so that your sisterhood can reach the goals it wants to achieve. We want every sisterhood to achieve those goals and we are here to help them. And we really believe that by engaging our members that each and every woman will find that sisterhood is the place for them to spend their time, to network together, to befriend each other, to work together for a common purpose. And we look to enrich the lives and the personal skills and the talents of every single woman. We look to empower every single woman so that she can achieve her goals, whether that's in the congregation or not, within her family structure, within her workplace, in the political arena, whatever, it doesn't matter. Wherever and however our women are involved, they have an opportunity to better their lives by the experiences they have being active in sisterhood. So thank you to all the members of this choir for attending this evening and giving us this hour and a half of your time. Thank you for being part of your sisterhoods and being part of Mid-Atlantic and our guests from Garden State and really for being part of the umbrella organization that we all love, Women's League for Conservative Judaism. Thank you, thank you Margie Miller for your continuing support of our region and your invaluable advice, which is always so generously given. Margie Miller will be leading the president's session when we go to breakout room shortly. Additionally, our Torah Fund session will be led by Shelley Swabinus, who is a member of Tefereth Israel Sisterhood. And adding her expertise to the Torah Fund conversation is Lori Snow of Congregation B'nai Jacob Sisterhood. Our treasurer, membership, and data manager session is led by Ariana Burrows of Melrose B'nai Israel Emmanuel Sisterhood and Beth Chernoff of Temple Sinai Sisterhood in Pennsylvania. Our public policy session is presented by Roberta Gordon of Oheb Shalom Sisterhood together with Debbie Zimmerman of Temple Beth Shalom Sisterhood, New Jersey. I'd like to acknowledge my summer training co-chair, Susie Markowitz, who, as she already told you, is a member of Melrose B'nai Israel Emanuel Sisterhood and Adith Israel in Pennsylvania. Our region president, Marsha Wasserman, is a member of Temple Harzion Sisterhood in New Jersey. And technology support for this event has been provided in-house by Barbara Sharofsky of Congregation Beth El Sisterhood, New Jersey. Don't want to forget a shout out to Leslie Blau Berlin of Congregation Beth Tikva Sisterhood, who aided us with our publicity. As you can see, our region relies on the strength and talents of our sisterhoods, and we are stronger together. Additionally, professional techni technology assistance has been provided by Karen Bellina. Thank you, Karen. And Leah Cooker someone I happen to know personally, designed our flyer. Now, just a brief advertisement, if you will allow me. In one year, Women's League will hold its convention in Schaumburg, Illinois, and the Mid-Atlantic region is dedicated to attending in large numbers. To that end, we have for years been holding fundraisers to support our scholarship program. We hope to hold an in-person fundraiser in January Please watch for exciting details. We will now go to our breakout rooms. Enjoy your program. We will reconvene in approximately 45 minutes for some final thoughts. Thank you.
Okay. If you're having a program on a topic and the region doesn't have an internet, a, a region share for that specific piece, international, I promise you does. Call the international chair, that, that's what she's there for. Say, we're having a program on social action, I don't even know where to begin, our region doesn't have one. And that gal, I guarantee you, will not get you off the phone, she'll be so excited that you used her as a resource and help you walk through what you might wanna do and accomplish in the course of that program. You're not alone, bottom line, you're not alone. And, and we'll discuss that later. So I, if I really had the time, I would have a quiz, but you can play by yourself and it's the honor system. How many regions? I already gave you the answer. You should know it. Your presidents, there are 13. The international president, that's Debbie. You just heard from her, Debbie Kaner Goldich. She's the current president. What is terror fund? If anybody says it's to buy terrorists, you should be the first to say, no, it isn't. How many seminaries? You should know we support five seminaries. These are just little things that you're a president of an organization, you should kind of know. Women's League has a convention every three years. We change our leadership every three years. You should kind of know that. How many people, now this is important for you as president, how many people can change, edit, or whatever, make changes to your sisterhood's data, information on the Women's League database? Four. You as president have the ability, you're coded into the computer. Your treasurer, your financial secretary, and each sisterhood can appoint a data manager. You give her that title, Women's League will code her name. So when she logs in, she'll be able to make changes to your sisterhood's um, data. So when Susie passes away, may she rest in peace, you can change it. When Mary moves, good for her, you can change it. When uh, Susie, you know, uh, pick another name, Selma comes to town and she's a new member, you want to put her in? Though any of those four people can do that. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, we'll go to those questions after. Just for sisterhood presidents, there's a sisterhood planner. It's a guide for sisterhood, a sample agenda, budgets, parliamentary procedure, job descriptions of your executive committee in a perfect world. If you don't have those titles, you move it around and, and don't worry about the titles, but who's taking care of those tasks. All of you should be on the Presnet. It's a chat group, women all over North America. Now, yes, once in a blue moon, somebody's cat gets sick and, and you get 300 emails saying, I hope your cat gets better. But in between that, someone will ask a question saying, what are you doing for paid up membership? It's our third year on Zoom. And you're gonna have 50 ideas before you press the enter button. Like use somebody else's ideas. Why do you wanna reinvent that wheel? Every one of you can ask for a mentor. Your sister can get a mentor or you as president. Consulting services, it's free. We'll get you somebody who can just walk the walk with you, organize you at the beginning, stay with you weekly, daily, monthly, yearly, whatever you need. And all of those services are free. And I just wrote that. Okay, so there you go. I'm going to try to go a little faster so I can have plenty of time for questions. The website, these are just some of you. I'm not going to read this. You can read it yourselves. I'll give you a moment. All of them. We we, we're not seeing the PowerPoint. At all? No. I thought you wouldn't present it yet. We oh, what did you it. tell me? Oh, I I'm didn't so sorry. know. Somebody put it in the chat and I apologize. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought Let you were giving it. an introduction to the PowerPoint. No, 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 no. So I'm so sorry. Let me know if you see it now. Yeah, yes. Okay, so sorry. Well, you'll get it in the mail. <laughs> you'll get it in the thing. <laughs> Um, let me go back one. I don't know how to do that. Oh, here we go. These are things that are, oh, now I see your faces much better. <laughs> much better. I like those faces. Um, these are things that you could find on the website. I, I mean, look at the list. Plus a hundred more. I'll just let you quickly glance at it. Anything anything, probably even recipes that were on there. So what do I know? Sisterhood in your region, you're part of a region, Garden State, Mid-Atlantic, whatever. If and when you invite a region officer to come to a paid up membership dinner, a Torah fund event, um, Women's League and the region budgets will cover their transportation, but we expect you to feed them. 
So if it's a luncheon, we are not having four women from a region show up to a $50 luncheon. But if the president comes, please feed her. If the Terra Fund gal goes instead, because it's a Terra Fund event, please feed them. The region will be very sensitive that they're not coming with an entourage unless it's a cookies and, you know, a milk and cookie kind of a thing. You know, in an evening, you know, you might have a bigger delegation at night and they're having a cup, a cup of coffee. Give them a moment to say hello. The president, the Torah fund, the membership chair, whoever, whatever fits to that program. Give them, you know, a minute or two, not just, you know, introduce them and they wave. They drove there for an hour to get to you. Let them have a moment to say hello. Put the region on your mailing list. Um, make sure, as I said, that you keep Women's League or what's going on in the region in your agenda. Pick that one thing that's applicable and, and bring it up to the women so that they understand. Our women don't understand what they're members of. And so they say, well, why, why, why do we even belong? But if every single month you take advantage of a program or something that you read on the website or that you got a training or that you got a mentor or that you shared a program with a, another sisterhood, and what, they understand, again, it's that value proposition. You can request a consultant. I said that once a year, it's free on any topic, membership, programming, um, restructuring your organization, leadership development, communication issues. You're having issues with the synagogue. You know, they're bumping you off the calendar morning and night. The rabbi doesn't give you whatever. We have programs and workshops on all those topics. You're entitled to them and they cost you nothing. Uh, leadership Institute we haven't had since, you know, uh, COVID, I'll, I'll pass on this and, and the Judaic, I'll, I'll pass on a few things so I can make it a little uh, speedier so we have a lot more time for questions. President's top 10 list. Pro this is how to be a president. You should never be surprised. There's nothing on the agenda that people just, oh, by the way, I'd like to make a motion that we do the, the, the. nope. It's not on the. It's not on your agenda. It's not on. It's not on your meeting. You control that, and you set the game. The, the rules of that game. So your agenda are reports that are submitted. Any new business should be in the form of a motion. Old business should be things that you've tabled. You don't ever want to um, rediscuss a committee's decision on how many, you know, on what kind of fried chicken they're serving, you know, bro broiled or roasted or, or fried. If the committee spent three hours dis discussing what they're serving at the paid up membership dinner, the executive committee is not the time to sit there and rehash and say, I don't like their decision. You don't bother empowering groups to do work and then sit there at a board meeting or an exec meeting and say, well, I want ripple potato chips. So I don't want the unrippled. Like, no, don't waste people's time. That's not, if you're gonna have a hospitality committee or if you're gonna have a program committee and all those gals are working behind the scenes, creating that, then you don't rehash it at a board or exec. You don't. That wastes people's time and then they, they just don't wanna volunteer because then they're wasting their time. So you wanna have the agenda sent out. You wanna have the reports sent out. A report should not be every single thing that everybody does. It should be the key, you know, the key pieces of what they want to let the group know. And so that the conversations at an exec or a board should really be targeted to the things that you really feel that the group needs to discuss, not the back committee work. That should be in reports. And if you have questions, trust me, you'll have we'll, we'll, we'll time. All your minutes and your correspondence should be, per, the, the president should know it. The president should be a, not a mother may I, but a, for an FYI. I was, you know, every president's different and I get that, but I was much more of an FYI. Keep me in the loop. Let me know what you're doing. You don't need my permission to discuss, you know, how many slices of pizza people are eating. I, I just, we're discussing a menu. Good enough. I don't, I don't believe in micromanaging. And if you have to know, then just then be honest with your group and say, okay, I'm really anal and I, I really want to sleep at night. So I really need to kind of have a sense of this and give me two weeks heads up so that I have time to whatever. Um, just own who you are. But remember, you're working with volunteers and you want to make sure that they're appreciated and they feel valued and we don't waste their time. And convention we talked about, so I'm going to pass that for a minute. Don't be afraid to ask questions. 
No one expects you to know all the answers. The region presidents don't know all the answers. There are very few people in this organization. Well, actually, I'm one of them, but know all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> I say modestly, but I probably do. Yeah. I probably do. Um, again, the bylaws, you're working with, uh, you should, here's something, number eight. You should know, not the work order so much, but you're working in a congregation. You don't want the executive director and the custodian, God forbid, and or the president and or the rabbi to feel like you're working against them. You want to have them understand that you're there as a team. You're there to, to really create a richer environment for the whole congregation. You're not looking to compete with them. You're looking to cooperate with them. And we have a lot of issues and a lot of shoals with, again, with executive directors who just, you know, poo poo sisterhood, or they, you know, it's not their thing, or the rabbi thinks, you know, they have a different philosophy about women's groups or men's groups or any groups, um, or, or the, the secretaries, and they just say, ah, sisterhood can change the date, you know, and meanwhile, it's on the calendar for a year. Um, that you, you need to sit down at the beginning of your term with the rabbi, the president of the synagogue, the executive director, if your shul has one, and say, I am a team player. I am on team B'nai Israel, whatever. I am not here to compete. I am here to cooperate. I want to work with you. And I will do anything and everything to make this relationship work. Here's what I'm hoping to do. Tell me how it fits into your vision. You, you know, I, I know it sounds like you're looking at me like some of you are saying, are you nuts? I would never do that. I'm suggesting you consider it. That's all I'm asking. All right. And, and let me pass on this. The mindset of a president, I'm almost done actually, you should all know so you can take a breath. You have to think beyond the tasks. There's a cute graphic here, which I can't see there. Margie, we lost your voice. Margie. <laughs> yeah. I just caught that, I just caught it. Okay. Everything you Nothing. do, has to have multiple reasons for doing it. It you was don't Margie. Want just what? it's me. No, Mark, it's me, Margie, not Mark. Um, you you don't just have a program without saying why are we having that program? What are we looking to gain from it? Is it just for and if there's not a right or wrong answer, but just own it. Um, will a program bring in new people? Will a program meet the needs of the people? Will a program um educate will a program just because you had to fill in the box because you had it on the temple calendar and you're just shoving it in um you have to think about why you're doing what you're doing and i guarantee that most of us just kind of do it and we don't really think about why are we running that particular program what's the value of it you have to diversify the programs if you're a very serious group, but that doesn't mean you study Talmud, poo -poo, God forbid, at every meeting. On the other hand, you can't just do fluff at every meeting. That's why to me, special interest groups are much more um, a, a way, a positive way for, for people to engage. And in small groups, you know, I don't care if four women decide the first Sunday of the month, they're gonna go walk around the park in your town. And, and, and 10 women are in the big group and, and eight women are playing Mahjong. I don't care whatever your groups are because the days of people coming to a program a month and getting the gastroenterologist to show up because somebody's husband's a gastroenterologist or she is, um, don't judge your success by the amount of people that show up at a program on a topic. I'd rather have more people participate in things that they care about because there's gonna be much more longevity to that than the, the loyalists that just show up at everything. But these are the conversations that sisterhoods never have. Um, I'm gonna just pass this, okay? And I'm at really at the end. You have to set goals. You have to really think, what, why do we exist? What are we looking, my favorite two questions, three questions I ask every group when I go, what is our purpose of existing? You know, like, why do we exist? Because if you don't know why you're existing, then you can't sell it to anybody else. So what is our reason for existing? But the other two are, what are we looking to accomplish? And what do we need to do to make that happen? 
Because I guarantee when your sisterhoods were founded in 1920, 1930, 1892, people didn't sit there and say, you're president, you're vice president, you're secretary. They had something they had to accomplish, whether it's to find a Hebrew school teacher for their kids, they were, you know, whatever. They, they had a reason that that group first got together without the titles. And it evolved from there. And sometimes I say, you know, let's go back to the basics. What are you looking to accomplish? And what do you need to do to make that happen? And if the structure you have now doesn't work for you anymore because you're filling in names to spots because that's how it's been done for the last 60 years, I say, get rid of it. Start from scratch, create a, temp create a different template and figure out a different way to function. But if you can't do that unless you really sit there and say, do we have goals? Are we looking to accomplish anything? And then try to be very specific. And you know what the SMART goals are, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and in a timely manner. So I'm gonna pass on that. And then my other thing is, and this is my last slide, I think, is for you to almost look at your sisterhood and not, this is my vision board. It's not yours, create your own or use mine. I look at every woman as if she's a single thread. A single thread. Now, if you ever did needlepoint or anything, there's not much strength to a single thread. But I look at our women and say each one individually, strong as she is, she's different. She's unique. She's all the colors in the in the you know the rainbow there. But what happens when you put two threads together or three threads or five threads together? They strengthen. And together they create a tapestry, which I call sisterhood. This is my vision. And so I, I often talk about this, the, the value of a thread, it, it, not that it's insignificant, but how strong and beautiful it is when the threads work together to create a tapestry, which is diverse and interesting. Um, and to me, all the possibilities that exist could be in sisterhood. So create a vision board for yourselves. I'm getting off of this thing. I think the last slide is question and answer anyway. So let me come back to this nice group of women, put you all on gallery that I've babbled enough. Okay. And now I get to see everybody's face. Hi, Susan. Um, and, and so these, this is really, you know, this is a two hour class that I just really shoved together in, in a 30 minutes. So for those of you that are new, or those of you that have been recycled, or those of you that are in re repeating, um, what was there anything I talked about that either st stuck, you know, spoke to you, um, or that you say, you know what, that's really something we're stuck in. Or so questions, challenges, we have time now. We've got plenty, I talk fast enough. So it's on you. So Lisa. Hi. Um I'm Lisa Framel from Out of Israel Mainline. I'm actually a past president. Um, we met with the consultant, one of your consultants, uh, and I had a, I had a co-president, and we were not able to recruit and get a president. But I, for personal, professional, I just was not able to continue. However, I am very committed to Women's League, and I, I care. I wanted, you know, I wanted to be part of tonight. I really appreciate, and for anyone who's new out there and walking into someone else, you know, following someone else and, some, and someone else's bad habits, perhaps. Um, I really think that what you ended with is critical to, to sisterhoods that you said, I know you said not to write, but I write, um, that to create a different template and, I'm, I mean, I, I want to continue that conversation offline, not monopolize time, but I really, um, I believe, and I could be wrong about this, but my personal belief, and I, if, I'm not sure if Terry's still on, is that um, as opportunities have evolved both on the BEMA and off the BEMA, such as boards and committees, that women have um, been recruited by the rabbi or been recruited by other arms of the synagogue because women are doers. And um, so then 
it's a question of like they can't be spread too thin. So then we we have we have a void in talent um, to fill, like you said, those titles. And I was, <laughs> excuse me, doing leadership development and getting really close. And then the pandemic came and the younger generations are just so burnt and they are being recruited, whether it be for to represent the preschool or represent the middle school or, right. or some of the new committees to, so that the synagogue doesn't have a leadership and a succession problem. Mm -hmm. So I was curious, um, you say create a different template. Um, I'd like, if possible, you or someone else to take that further. All right, I, I'll do that in 25 words or less. Okay. I have a whole class on, on leadership development, but the bottom line is the eighth and ninth slide are options for you. And I've done it before, if any of you ever heard me do it, are, are options when you don't have someone saying yes. So the first seven slides are, you know, trying to develop leadership, how to answer the no's, what are they saying no to? It's, it's right. you know, the background. But when you get to slide eight, which is the last slide, I think, it's what, it, what choices do we have? And I have that. I'll send that to everyone as well. Marsha, do me a favor and just write this down so I remember to send not just to Lisa. Um, let me just tell you, and very quickly, uh, I, I believe in creating a void because sometimes it doesn't, the, the group doesn't collapse. And you think that, oh my God, if no one's there, it'll collapse. And I challenge you to say maybe that won't happen. And I'll give you five quick examples. Flint, Michigan, I've done these a thousand times. Flint, Michigan has a president a month. Now I could think it's insane, I blame the water, but meanwhile, they've been doing it for close to 20 years. I told that to a Hempstead, Long Island sisterhood years ago. I said, crazy Flint, what do I know? They did it. They had a president a month. The girl that ran the Hanukkah boutique was there every day in December. She said, I'll be December's president. Tuba Shabbat chair. She was there in February. She was in February. The next year, you know what happened? There was six because the girl said, I'm in Hanukkah boutique. I'm in there for two months. I'll do two months. You know what happened year three? They had one president. So sometimes when you create the most absurd craziness, mm -hmm. it shuckles down. People are not scared. They survive the, like the trauma of, my God, we don't have a president. We do have, we have one a month. And, and then by year three, they had one. Uh, I'll give you a few more. Houston, Texas. I think it's a waste of talent, but there's one of the shuls. They pair people up. It's a president, a first year person and a second year person. And so that someone's always the, the, the teacher and someone's always the learner. And no one feels that they're in it by themselves. I think the talent goes fast too fast in that system. But again, who am I to tell them not to do it? Um, there are sisterhoods that my sisterhood that just created a, um, it would it used to be called a steering committee. It's called a governing body. We have somebody call the president because she's 97. No, she isn't. She's about 85. Um, but anyway, she's the president for Women's League because we needed a name. And we do everything together as a, as a governing body. Another example is one group that has teams. They have five teams because if you really think about the unique task that a president has to do, um, there aren't that many, believe it or not. So they have, well, I have two different groups. One has each vice president took on one task. One runs the meeting, period. She does, she's programming VP and she runs the exec meetings. One gal, she's the membership gal. She does the signature on the checks. That's the one extra task she added to her jobs. And so you take those have to do president tasks and ask everyone to take one, the signature representing the women's, the sisterhood on the board, bless you, bless you right. Um, running the meetings, uh, there aren't that many. I, I, she doesn't have to write the articles. She doesn't have to give the bar and bat mitzvah presentation. She got a hundred other people rotate them through. You have the custodian do it. It doesn't have to be the president. And the last one is teams. That was the, the last of these five or six choices. Everything is run, there's five teams. There's a hospitality team, a programming team, an administrative team, and you have three people-ish. Five would be wonderful, but let's be realistic. And, that, and then you just break up the chores to how to, what are we looking to do? What do we need to have, we're gonna do it? So the hospitality will just manage the food at every event, period. They don't care what we're doing, that's it. And, and I have all this written down. So I'm gonna send you all that too. So there are, there are solutions, Lisa. You are not the only one. And trust me, it's not synagogues. The Knights of Columbus can't find presidents. Kiwanis can't find a president. Nobody can find. So we're stuck on these titles because that's how we were raised. And my suggestion is get the task done. And I don't care if you call them queen for a day and an Indian chief. I don't care. 
Don't mm -hmm. worry about the task. People are more willing to take on a task than the title. But it was a great question. Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. One thing you said was to add your regional address to your mailing list. Does that mean I send stuff to Marsha or do I send it to somebody else? Okay. Number one is we don't use the word regional ever in women's league. Uh, this is my thing. I thought you said what I thought it said what add your region to the Oh yeah, I thought you said regional. You yes. Yes. So if you're from if you're from um uh, what you know, mid-Atlantic, mid then you should have your if you have a temple bulletin or something, send it to Marsha. Because if Marsha doesn't have the time to read 30 of them and she skims through them and says, Oh my God, look what the program that they did at Cherry Hill, she's gonna send it to Debbie Zimmerman or whoever her programming person and say, Oh my god, look at this article, uh, whatever. So yes, send it to Marsha. And for those of you from Garden State, send it to Lynette. Um, if they can't manage it, they might have. My region used to have a woman. That was her job. She read all the sisterhood bulletins in the old days when there were hard copies. We had them all mailed to one gal. She read them all and she'd circle and, and this one had this and this. And, and that's a great job for somebody, you know, at a region level. Um, if if the president can't manage to start reading everybody's emails from each sisterhood. Okay, my second question is regarding the bylaws. I know there was just the change to that we're no longer list considered sisterhoods and we're supposed to be called affiliates. You could have call yourself whatever you want. You can, you I, may call yourself anything you want. Sisterhood. Do we need to change our bylaws to reflect no. what the region says? No, no, that's what I'm telling you. Women's League, is trying to be respectful of many groups that have changed their names to women of Aliyah, sisters of uh, Massapequa, whatever. So rather than just call them all sisterhoods, they're turning into the, 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 the groups that choose to affiliate with Women's League. But you may continue to use the word sisterhood till all of us are long gone. You may choose to change your name to the women of Cherry Hill or Beneath Beth Shalom or the you know, mother's what you can change your name and you may stay sisterhood. You do not have to change your bylaws. Women's League is going to refer to your group is either a sisterhood or an affiliate, but that's for them. That's not you. Is there any time that we have to change to match what the region says in terms of bylaws? No, sisterhoods are independent. Okay. We get we'd like you to be you know, we don't want anything halakhically or illegal, you know, but other than that, you're on your own, you're independent groups, but it's just trying to keep the terminology when we refer to groups, you know, most of us say sisterhood. So women's like saying, you know what, well, some of them don't call themselves sisterhoods. Fine. They want to call it affiliates, but you may call yourself a sisterhood till the end of eternity. You're an okay, independent. Thank you. group. You're welcome. Susan. Yeah. Hi, Margie. I kind of had a related bylaws question. So sure. there's no, another organization I belong to has a requirement that the local chapters have to have their first two or three bylaws matching what is in the national, the membership requirements and things like that. That's not a requirement for the bylaws. No, no. And here's the example. It. Here's your example. Women's League, uh, five years ago, don't quote me took out the word Jewish in women's league. Your rabbi and in your congregation might say, that doesn't work for us and or it does. We also took out, we added in a woman or someone who identifies as a woman. Identifies as a woman right. Again, your sisterhood might say not for us and or our rabbi says, no, no, no. You know, I, I'm giving the extreme. Yeah, examples. my rabbi would absolutely love that. <laughs> you know, I'm giving the extreme examples. Yeah. So in Women's League as an organization will have bylaws. The regions have to stay with Women's League because they are, I was trying to give myself a timer so I knew the time. Um, so the regions must stay with Women's League because they are us. But uh, you, are not, you are not us. Ah, uh, okay. You are not us. You are independent organizations that choose to affiliate with the mothership. I see. It's okay. like, I look at this as like a PTA in a school. Mm -hmm. if, the, if they associated with the state PTA or not, every school, if it's 10 people or 500 people have a parents group. If they right. choose to affiliate with PTA, 
But that's your, it's not Hadassah, which is a bad example, easy example, because that's a top down organization. You don't belong to the local chapter. You belong to Hadassah local chapter of. Mm-hmm. That is not the same mm-hmm. format that Women's League has. Right. Or independent well, that, sisterhood. Yeah. The main reason I ask is my other organization is bottom up, is grassroots. And so, but they still have some of those requirements. Okay. We, how well, do we, we do ask. The bi- I mentioned bylaws to the people on my sisterhood and they look at me like, what are you talking about? We, we don't have those. I mean, but we do ask. Somewhere. But if you're going to belong to Women's League, we do ask that you hold a cash root uh, standard. And sure. what you do in your own home, we don't care. But if you're right. doing it under the name of a sisterhood or an affiliate, please don't go to Red Lobster for lunch. Um, even if you're all having salad, <laughs> like just don't do that. But see the difference? Yeah, yeah. But Andrew, you're getting, getting the bylaws. I, I don't know where to get them from. I don't. Oh no. Well, first of all, if you can't find them, we have modeled it on the in the website. And right. or the region can send you. You can start with ours. You can also go on the Presnet and say, could people send me their bylaws? So you're going to okay. get 50 of them. But 50 are nice because then you can go through them. One second, Eileen. Yeah. Andrew, did you have your hand up? You were waving, but you didn't raise it the other way. And then I'm coming to Eileen. I have a question. So yes, this honey. concerns the bylaws. We were thinking about doing our, changing our bylaws last year. Now, there were some things in that we didn't agree with and we wanted to, um, but, but the interaction of the, I guess, our congregation. So the main question is when we, they said that we can't change our bylaws unless they vote on it and they only vote on it once a year. Is that, is that the way it goes? You know what? I, I'm going to say something you're not going to like. Go ahead. You, you're a club in a group. You're a club in a legal entity, which is the congregation. That's why they can ask to see your books. They have a fiduciary responsibility. Now mm-hmm. we might not like that and we don't want them to see. Okay, but bottom line is the congregation is the legal entity by the state of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, wherever you are. So they could, in their constitution of when they were founded, might have a stipulation unless they change that to say we have final approval on any arms bylaws. Okay. Unless you change the constitution of the bylaws of a congregation to say that's that was something you did 70 years ago, do you have to have it in there now? They could change that. But yes, yes, okay. sorry, yes. That's fine. Okay. okay one more. Uh, is that help you? And Eileen, you were last. Yeah, I was just going to add, okay, because Susan hasn't gone through the Garden State Region training yet, but as an organization, you should have bylaws. You I should know. have a mission statement, okay? Uh, a lot of sisterhoods, in my experience, didn't have a mission statement, okay? They didn't have goals. Women's League provides just a template of bylaws. And a lot of sisterhoods, I know my sisterhood, uses the Women's League bylaws, mm-hmm. okay? We use them. They may not be appropriate for Oakhurst. I don't know, okay? They are. But I read it's a start. Good. It's a start. It's tweakable. But don't reinvent the wheel, like Margie said. Oh, right. You need bylaws. Yes. You need a mission statement. Start with what Women's League provides you, and then adjust it instead of writing from scratch. Okay. And make it, them fluid. That's a great point, Eileen. And make them fluid. Never have president. Nowadays, have the S. Because then it's one right. to twelve. If we go into the Flint example, uh, uh, yeah, you know, make them so that you don't have to keep changing them when circumstances change. Yeah. And mm-hmm. if you make them fluid enough and never specific, bylaws can't be specific. Your policies are specific. How much are we right. going to get the honorarium, right. or how much mm-hmm. are we spending for the plant when Mary gets sick? That's policies. Bylaws, right. you're not changing those every ten minutes. Trust me, you don't. I want understand. To. So you want them really <laughs> to work with you, mm-hmm. but they are. Is, I hate to say it, they're not as kosher as we want them to be, mm-hmm. Andrea, because it's the congregation that holds the legal status. And the congregation nowadays, especially with the money, you know, they have multiple groups within a congregation. They, they want to have some make sure that we're halakhically or kosher or whatever, um, or not illegal. So they have the a PTA, they could have a PTA, they could have a men's group, they have a women's group, they could have a young couple's group, they could have a singles group. There's a lot of pieces in that pie. So that's why. 
Oh, my son is calling me. Sorry, kid, I can't talk to you. <laughs> um, all right, is it time for us to be out? I don't want to. We just we just got a five minute warning. Yeah. Oh, five okay. minutes. All right, Dorothy, tell me where you're from. You're so quiet down there in the what? muted button in the world. She has that mute. She's muted. I'm Dorothy, muted. you're on. You're muted. But I believe she's from Morristown, New Jersey. Oh, okay. All right, nice. Dorothy. Been there many times. Morris or Morris? Morris. Morristown. Morris, North. Um, yeah, kind of northwest. Can we unmute Dorothy by uh, can I unmute her? I don't know if I have the power. I don't know if I have the power. Okay, now I'm there, she is. Oh. there you are. Like my my computer was updating when I wanted to go on. And then when I finally could get on, I couldn't get into the president's thing. So ah. yeah. I, I enjoyed what you said. I mean, I would like to have follow up in prints because I didn't sit here and, and write everything down. I, that's why I, I told you, it. we're gonna send you the whole presentation and I'm gonna make sure that you get that leadership one. And if any of you want a leadership workshop like the one I'm gonna send you also, a consultant can do that and or her own, but I'll send yeah. you mine. I am from the Morristown Jewish Center in Morristown. So no, nice. <laughs> know it well. Very nice. Well, welcome. And mm -hmm. Eileen, are you okay? She's quiet also over there. I'm fine. I'm oh which Eileen? No, the other Eileen. The other Eileen, no. And Michelle. Oh, Harzion. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, I, just, I have to say, I really liked your idea about president for a month because this is my third year and I did two years ago, 10 years back, and we have to get new blood. I mean, we have very competent people, but the girls, for whatever reason, they don't want to step up to be president. And um, it's it's very difficult, but we might go into president a month. You know, you know what? I always chuckle and I always say it's the water and I make fun of poor Flint, but who am I to make fun of a group that hasn't working for close to 20 years? And and there's a joke, which I don't tell jokes, but um, how do you yes. eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. And yeah. sometimes when you literally break down the presidency and say, look, if everyone just takes a bite, it'll be done. And, and again, when you create that void, don't be frightened of it. Because again, that Hempstead example that I gave you, the next year, six women said, I'll do two months. And yeah, the next year they were back to one. So that don't don't be frightened by the extreme, like odd idea, as long as it gets what you need to have done, done. Right. I, and things I do chuckle have, out. I, I have a volunteer to write the bulletin article every month, which is a godsend because that was became a real drag, you know. So she does that and you know, I, I keep after everybody else. So <laughs> but that, you know, again, when it goes to leadership, you I always ask people like, what if it's, everyone said no, they said no. And I, I had it's a long story and I'm not gonna tell it to you. Somebody you know, came to me, but they said no, the people we thought. I said, go back to them and say, what did you say no to? What was that one thing that you said, I could do this, but I won't do that. Turns out these young women in a very big shoal, they didn't want to do any public speaking. And so these older gals, the nominating committee came back to me and like, they don't want to do public speaking, but the president always does, you know, the, the bar mitzvah. I said, did Moses write that on the tablets? You got a hundred past presidents. It's a big synagogue. Trust me. Let them rotate it around. You know what? Those girls took the presidency. They took it off the table. That was no longer a task that the president had to do it. Took it off the table. Those girls said, yes. Michelle has a question. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, um, how would you address the situation where I already have someone in mind who would be a good, um, the ne next good president? And I've already talked to her to let her know that I, I think she, she would be. And she said, honestly, it would depend on who is like the president of the synagogue at that time, because there are certain people she just won't work with. So I'm already thinking, well, how do I get around this? <laughs> so, um, you know um, that's a, well, again, it goes to that conversation I had by having a sit down. Maybe, maybe the next time, is she a vice president? She's doing something. She's one of the financial secretaries. Now. All right. You know what? Maybe I, if I were you just to like play this hand out, mm -hmm. I would bring two other women and make her one of them and have that sit down with the president, the executive director, the rabbi, bring a financial person, one of the VPs in you. So it's not by yourself. You're not alone. 
and have that dialogue like I was talking about. And if she's part of that process with the beginning of those relationships and talking about the issues that they have with concern about how people are treating sisterhood or the respect that they get or don't get, if she's part of that conversation at the beginning, then maybe she'll realize, you know what, this is, this is workable. I can work through this. I, there's, a, there's a method to this. And there's a, a, there's a route to making sure that that's not an obstacle. Right. We just don't know, like the president's also going to change over in the middle of my term. So we don't know who it's going to be. So that's. Well, it's not going to be someone who's not on the executive committee. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, they're dealing with the same issues as, right. as us and finding people, but right. yeah. But that, um, that might be a suggestion, but again, you know, we can't control everything. We mm -hmm. can try, but we can't. We can't. All right. So anybody else? Yes, Sherry sorry. has her hand up. Yes. I just wanted um, to mention, Shana Galco is a rabbi. She was in California. She's just moving to New York. She's one of our kids. Um, she did a really great study for the synagogue there about getting young people in their 20s and 30s involved. And the, the reality of what she found was you need to ask for specific tasks. If you ask them to come to something or to help with something, they're, they're going to say no because they're too busy. You ask them, can you take attendance for me? They'll say yes. Can you bring this? They'll say yes. And since I read that article, it has really helped. And I've, my, I'm the new president for Temple by Shalom. My board, except for two, are brand new board members, exec board members. And most of my board is in the 30s and 40s, wow. which is a huge changeover. But it's worked because I picked up the phone and said, you know, I really need, could you do this? I don't have time. Or I don't know how to do this. Can you help me and show me this? And once you get them one and one thing, That's and my right. big thing that I keep telling everyone is this is really the place where you can make your friends. That's right. And again, if you go back to the elephant, I once had a woman who was, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. And I, the path mark doesn't exist. A block away was path mark. And I finally went to this woman, I'm busy, I'm busy. Like, who's not busy? And I said, look, you have to do me a favor. You have one year's notice. Three half gallons of apple juice for breakfast. That's all. I cannot do one more thing. You're in the supermarket. The shelf life of apple juice is an eternity. The custodian will pour it and he'll buy the cups. I am telling you for 20 years, we let her have no term limits. She was my apple juice chair. I made that, I didn't want her to think that's all she was worth, but I made that task so little she didn't have the you know what to say no to me. Um, so I will put my, my phone number and, and uh, name in the chat after this. Um, we have a total of 45 minutes, including questions and discussions. And as we near that 45 minute mark, the system will alert us and everyone will be brought back together for some final words. Um, so we are at this point recording. Good evening. This is a breakout session of the summer training for the Mid-Atlantic Region of Women's League. I'm Roberta Gordon, the Mid-Atlantic Region Public Policy Chairperson. I am a member of Ohev Shalom, an active member and former president of Sisterhood, and an associate member at Shirat Hayam, like Terry, um, and a member of their Sisterhood. And uh, also, and, and Debbie, yes. Hi, <laughs> Debbie. Um, yeah, I, I, will, I will welcome you, Debbie. Thank you. We are honored to have you here with us tonight. Um, welcome, Debbie. Thank you. Um, also speaking tonight will be Debbie Zimmerman. She is the Mid-Atlantic Region Education Vice President and a member of the International Board of Women's League. And she's also a former president of Temple Beth Shalom Sisterhood. Um, so, so glad all of you have joined me in this breakout room and you've got enough interest in public policy and social action. Oh, and special welcome to our guests from Garden State Region and the Florida Region. So welcome, yeah. Um, and let's see. Okay, so um, hopefully this evening's discussion will inspire you to educate and share these ideas with your sisterhood. So we all know that, uh, that Women's League has a website, wlcj.org, 
And what I didn't know were that there are so many of our resolutions of Women's League right on the website. So straight from the website, for many years, Women's League has been creating resolutions. And I'm going to show you some really interesting historical ones. The, for the <clears throat> past several decades, when members of Women's League gathered at the International Convention, delegates debated and adapted resolutions on a wide variety of issues that impacted the world that we live in as women and as Jews. And these, these resolutions direct our action, our social action. And of interest to me, these resolutions are a timeline into history. Um, and actually on a side note, I just found out that we have a representative on at the UN. Um, Lucy Becker is the Women's League World Affairs Chair. Um, and we're represented as an NGO, though right now that's shut down due to COVID, but I never knew that we had representation uh, in, from Women's League at the UN. Um, anyway, back to public policy. Um, I, what I find interesting about WSLCJ.org, which I'm gonna share with you in a minute, is that you don't have to be a member or log in to see the resolution. Yeah, nod your head if you can see that, please, somebody. Yes, good, thank you. <laughs> okay, so here is the, um, the, the WLCJ.org. Okay, up here in the right-hand corner, there's a little search uh, tool. Right here, if you click on resolutions and click go, and give it an extra minute because we are we got a lot of technology. Scroll down to the second finding resolutions. Here they are. And I was quite surprised at what comes up. I mean, look at all these A's and B's and C's. And I mean, on and on and on. Um, the interesting thing is that I found them going back to 1950. I'll show you one down here um, that I found. Where is it? It was. Um, the Subversive Control Act to abolish the House on American Activities Committee. There it is, 1950, right there. Uh, there's another one from 1950. Um, a resolution encouraging the United Nations to bar Franco Spain from membership and urging the government of the United States to withhold any aid to Franco Spain. So, I mean, this is our this is our history, but it's also very contemporary and uh, some of the resolutions, unfortunately, are still relevant to our problems today. There was, in 1958, there was a bombings of houses of worship resolution, that, and that hurts. But I mean, even though we are more conscious of security needs than ever, we still suffer from violence coming into our houses of worship. Um, yeah, and there's, there's other resolutions about the environment, and elder care and voting rights, special needs. But tonight I just thought we would explore a couple of resolutions. Um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about gun violence, equal rights, religious pluralism in Israel at the Western Wall and women's health. So let's go back to the start with the gun violence. Unfortunately, we still have to start with that and I see that there were at least two resolutions um, for that one. So the one from 2000 talks about um, a sensible cooling off period, tougher background checks, um, and enlisting corporate America to um, and local businesses to that guns in the wrong hands are unacceptable and to promote education on gun safety. Uh, this one on gun violence, which we're going to look at now, um, sort of, you know, it goes through a background, the whereas part, and then we resolve that Women's League encourages its members to lobby their local, state, and federal lawmakers to support required background checks on all public and private gun sales, ban on military-style assault weapons, high-capacity magazines, and legislation to make gun trafficking a federal crime. Now, of course, there was just a new bill passed after recent gun rampages in Buffalo, New York and Uvalde, Texas. 
um, that incrementally toughens requirements for young people buying guns and denies firearms to domestic abusers and helps local authorities temporarily take weapons from people judged to be dangerous. Uh, you know, we're, we're still fighting this battle, even though this one was from 2014. Uh, okay, let's let's head back to, uh, let's see. We're gonna head back. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to go to the main menu again because it looks like my back is covered. Let me see what's going on here. No, um, hang on, we're gonna go back to the main menu because I am unable to get to where I wanna be, which is the equal rights one. Um, and when we talk about equal rights, there was one in 2021 uh, that talked about um, the Jewish community and our values of positive and enriching relationships with minority communities. Uh, we, we had resolutions dating back more than 60 years on the subject of racial profiling, racial tensions, civil rights, and we strongly urge our members to work with all communities for the cause of social action, education, responsible law enforcement, and to support programs that address issues of bias and bigotry. All right, let's see if we can't get back to our resolutions here. Okay. Okay, so then there's the one um, in, about Israel, about religious pluralism at the Western Wall. So let's go down to Israel here and see all of these wonderful resolutions on Israel. Um, and there's one right here about that. And in 1990, uh, Women's League affirmed by resolution that religious pluralism is essential to Jewish unity, that the Western Wall in Israel is a cherished holy place for all Jews, and that women have a right to worship at the wall free from intimidation and harassment. So therefore, be it resolved that Women's League believes that the government of Israel should implement the Mandelblit plan swiftly and without delay and um, make a plan, this is a plan for progressive and egalitarian prayer at the Western Wall. And we still have the women of the wall trying to pray quietly and calmly. And it's still a problem, unfortunately, that we're dealing with today. The last set of resolutions that um, I wanna talk about, and I encourage you to explore a lot of these on your own, is um, about women's health and um, also about reproductive rights. So there's one from 2020 about reproductive rights and one from 2022 about women's health. So I am gonna take, I'm gonna go a little out of my order um, and I'm gonna talk about the 2022 one first because that's the one that says like, we women have not been studied so much in medical research um, and we're trying to get the medical establishment to understand that women's bodies are not the same as men's bodies and that our conditions have been understudied and sometimes we are misdiagnosed um, and our health unfortunately gets seriously impaired due to the misdiagnosis. Um, therefore, we at Women's League Support the creation of women's initiatives in medical research, policies, and education. Promote research leading to individual gender-based medical care. And encourage public education and medical education for physicians and healthcare providers regarding gender disparities. And we will also advocate for increased public and private funding, support research, uh, with the goal of affordable, equitable, and high quality care for all. And um, we uh, 
want to encourage our affiliates to sponsor educational programming that advocates best outcomes for a woman's health. Um, now, I, I would like to go back to the health reproductive rights um, resolution from 2020, which is right here. And we talk about biblical and rabbinical sources providing background for a woman's right to bodily autonomy and, um, the, and the relative rights of a woman versus that of a fetus. And whereas abortion in Jewish law is primarily for the mother's physical or mental wear welfare. Therefore, be it resolved that Women's League for Conservative Judaism urges its sisterhood and members to support a woman's right to make her own decisions regarding reproductive issues and to oppose any legislation and judicial attempts to limit options per pertaining to abortion. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna stop the share and we'll come back to seeing everybody. And at this point, I would like to invite Debbie Zimmerman to, um, to share some of her thoughts on uh, Road versus Wade, the Supreme Court recent decision. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing me these couple minutes and uh, Roberta for that nice history lesson uh, leading into what we're, uh, I'm about to talk about. So, oh, that Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe versus Wade is certainly a major topic of discussion. And while I may think I know where most of us stand on the issue, I will never assume. So realizing that there are many views on the subject, we're not here to discuss the audacity or merits of this decision. We're here to tell you what Women's League United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism and the Rabbinical Assembly have to say on the matter. So this training session is not here to discuss the abortion decision. It's a public policy and resolution seminar. As you can see, there have been resolutions on the subject, but we're here today to discuss policy, social change and social action. And this is important to us as an international women's organization while the laws in the states in our mid-Atlantic region are somewhat forgiving, we have sisters and affiliates all around the United States where women will be greatly affected, as will our daughters, our granddaughters, our nieces, and future generations of women. So what do we know? We all know now that the constitutional right to privacy that gives women control over their bodies will be replaced by state-to-state -state political debates. Women's League sent out statements from the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, as well as the Rabbinical Assembly that you all should have received in the weekly email blasts. What I'm going to read are excerpts from these statements in case you missed them. So this is what Ned Gladstein, president of United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism had to say. Now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned and the political debate is intensifying across our country, our responsibility as citizens is to engage in that debate. As we each form our own individual judgment on this vital issue, I urge us all to learn what our Jewish tradition has to say. So what does our Jewish tradition have to say? So I went to myjewishlearning.com and this is what it said. Jewish law does not share the common belief among abortion opponents that life begins at conception, nor does it legally consider the fetus to be a full person deserving of protections equal those accorded to human beings. In Jewish law, a fetus attains the status of a full person only at birth. So back to Ned Gladstein. He says, when a state passes a law to ban or limit abortion, 
It takes the authority and responsibility for these choices away from the families, religious leaders, and women, and gives that authority to the state. So what did the rabbinical assembly have to say? And I'll urge you all to go onto the website and read these yourself. It's all on uh, the Women's League website. So what did the rabbinical assembly have to say? Conservative rabbis strongly condemn the US Supreme Court decision to overturn abortion rights. They commit to supporting legislation and holding up reproductive freedom. The rabbinical assembly is outraged by the decision of the US Supreme Court to end the constitutional right to abortion and deny access to life-saving medical procedures for millions of individuals in the United States in what will be regarded as one of the most extreme instances of governmental overreach in our lifetime. The rabbinical assembly went on to say that they support the right to full access for all those who need abortions to the entire spectrum of reproductive health care and opposes all efforts by governmental, private entities, or individuals to limit or dismantle such access. The rabbinical assembly calls on members of Congress to decisively codify Roe versus Wade into law to enshrine the right to health, freedom, and dignity of all Americans. So these are all very strong words. So what can we do as members of the Women's League uh, for Conservative Judaism? What can we do? We were all wondering what Women's League had to say on the subject. So we reached out to Debbie Goldich, our international president, who is on this breakout session with us. Hi, Debbie. And this is what she told us. The official viewpoint of Women's League International is based on several contributing factors. We are an educational, not a political organization. As a religious 501c3, we are not permitted to promote any political point of view. She also told us that Women's League mission includes promotion of education, support of Torah Fund, and support of Israel. There are lots of other Jewish organizations with different missions that address social action. And Women's League urges all affiliates to get involved as you independently see fit. You can be involved in your own name, but not in the name of Women's League. But most importantly, please make sure that your actions are in line with the views of your own synagogue and your own rabbi. I personally urge all of you to do what is in your heart when it comes to this matter. That might look like having a discussion in your affiliate as to what is appropriate given the views of your synagogue. Or it may be something that you wanna do personally. You might participate in a social action project or you may decide to be an advocate of an organization. This is a historic time for women and the future female leaders in your family. Make it your own path to the extent that you are able. Thank you. And now I turn it back to Roberta for a discussion on the difference between social action and social advocacy. I wonder if I might have one moment to clarify my words. Yes, please. Can I be all right? Thank yes, you. Please. Um, so we are not only a 5013C, but we have special tax status that's 5013C church status, which is a subcategory of 5013C. And it took us quite a long time to get that church status. What that means is that we are equivalent to the Catholic Church, the Protestant Church. We have a sanctuary. We have a leader. We, you know, we have a sanctuary. It's at JTS. It's called the Women's League Seminary Sanctuary. Um, and so that church status gives us incredible tax benefits, but it also puts limitations on what we can say. Um, and I've been asked, 
by my friend Karen Cooper, who says, well, the Catholic Church comes out against abortion. They're allowed to say it. Yes, they are. I don't think the tax laws and the tax czar of the United States of America is going to take on the Catholic Church, but they might take on Women's League. So we mind our P's and Q's and don't come out um, with any kind of political action statement that goes against what the laws of the United States are. Okay. Um, yes. And I also want to comment on your comment about social action. We're not saying that we don't um, approve so social action, but we approve social action measures that fit into our mission statement. And of course, you stated our mission statement. Our mission statement is education, connection to Israel, um, tour, supporting Torah Fund and our seminaries. And so social action can be anything in your sisterhoods. For example, our um, social action project is Stock the Shelves, Feed the Hungry. And uh, I know one of the sisterhoods that I belong to, Temple Sinai in Drescher, Pennsylvania, every meeting that we have that's an in-person meeting, we bring something to support some social action projects. So for example, um, one, one meeting we brought gift cards for um, the Ronald McDonald House. One meeting we brought canned goods for stock the shelves. One meeting we brought, you know, um, uh, pencils and pens to put in the knapsacks for the kids at school in underprivileged areas. And so of course we do believe in social action, but it has to fit within our mission. The other comment that I want to make, and I know Karen and I have talked about this many times, is that um, in Women's League, we believe that we should do what we do well. And what we do well is education and connecting with Israel. We are not a political action organization. And so we leave that to the other Jewish women's organizations that do that well, such as JCPA, JWI, um, Hadassah. Those are the organizations that are built on the foundation of political action. And those are the organizations that have that in their mission statement. We partner with them in different things, but that's not our mission statement. And it's not what we do well. What we do well is educating our women. So um, with that said, we come out with resolutions that uh, we think are in line with what we do well, but we don't come out with political action statements. There's a big difference. Um, and Roberta did this really well when she talked about resolutions. There's a big difference between resolutions and political action statements. And so we come up with resolutions that we think care for the well being of our women and our communities. Debbie, thank you so much for uh, that addition and for clarifying uh, all of my comments. It's really greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me the minute to do that, Debbie. Of course. <laughs> and now back to Roberta. Okay, yeah, thank you, Debbie and Debbie <laughs> for, <laughs> for that. Um, you know, we talked about resolutions, but resolutions also give us direction. And I sort of want to talk about advocate, ad, activism versus advocacy. So um, I took this from a 2021 article on the website of the US Institute of Diplomacy and Human Rights. An activist is a person who strongly believes in political or social change and takes part in public protests to try to make this happen. Uh, they make the noise, um, but Advocacy is to publicly support or suggest ideas, developments, or ways of doing something. <clears throat> An advocate can be understood as someone who listens, the one who has the specialized knowledge. Uh, they work within the system and they work with politicians, try to get the problems solved in a way that invites people to get involved in a more tempered way. Um, convincing others that your cause is worthy requires listening to their thoughts and uh, working through things with them. It may be a long and difficult road, but activism is more, more about, um, no, advocacy is about working to identify solutions 
and inviting all parties to listen to each other's problems. Advocates allow for education for change. Um, it's not that difficult. Well, it might be, but we're trying not to make it difficult. And sometimes anyone, you know, you can just get involved and work with education. Uh, advocates are more likely to have insight into sustainable long-term change. So I have a little slideshow to share with you um, about the social action part of uh, what follows from the resolution. So please uh, bear with me as I share the screen. And there we go. Okay. Okay, here we go. Public policy and social action. So I know that Debbie mentioned some do's and don'ts, but I really wanted to put it out there. Um, we, we, our sisterhoods have to follow the fact that we never endorse candidates. We are a 401 C3 organization. We are not permitted. We can't push one political party over another. We can't favor this one or that one. We can't say this one's good and that one's bad. That is a definite no-no. But we can become involved, here's the green light, with issues that are important to us in keeping with our values from the conservative movement and that draw on our Jewish tradition and heritage and values and be in line with the positions of the rabbinical assembly. And um, also um, we could even do letter writing campaigns or educational programs or attend a protest or a march, but not on Shabbat. And, but in order to do this as our sisterhood, we have to check with our rabbi and our shul first to be in line with what they have to say. Um, so here's some areas of social action we have, um, I was thinking about, and I was thinking about people, I was thinking about the planet, and I was also thinking about animal welfare. Um, with people, you know, we just talked about it. We were thinking about hunger. So the kinds of things that one can do, what would be to um, to have a food drive, to encourage donations of non-perishable food to a local food pantry. As Debbie said, maybe every time you have a meeting, say, you know, this this meeting we are collecting, you know, non-perishable foods. Please bring something. Um, you could also volunteer have you know send like a rotating staff of volunteers in to work a few hours each week at a food bank to help pack distribution uh boxes or or straighten the place out um meal delivery is another thing that we could uh work on prepare and deliver hot meals to elderly disabled or homebound folks um another thing and i'm sure our synagogues do this would be the Sunshine Committee to organize, uh, you know, to take food or supplies to families experiencing difficulty or hard times. Um, for healthcare, that's another place that we can get involved a little bit with hosting a blood drive, um, packing goodie bags for sick kids in the hospital. I'm sure they're they're always welcome. Um, if if we do this, encourage young folks to go into healthcare careers, have our healthcare workers speak at a career day event to encourage more uh, young people to go into healthcare. So here's something about voting rights, a way we can get involved. We can do a voter registration drive. We can do a get out the vote drive. We could, you know, become poll drivers and help senior citizens and others um, to drive them to a polling place. Um, and we could even become, encourage our members to be poll workers uh, to help maintain the integrity of the election process, very important. We also talked about Israel. So I, I spoke with um, Ellie Kremer, who is the, I believe the International Israel chair and um, they came up with some of these ideas to support 
the conservative and the sortie movement in Israel. They had these Israel program days of study for a year uh, in the past before COVID, but now they're doing a bunch on Zoom. But basically they did one um, you know, in the in the regions where all the Masorti women could get together for a whole day of study, and then they would do one central one, and everybody would bus in to a central place. Um, and you know, this year's study session, I was told, um, ranged uh, talked about they talk about biblical stuff and modern stuff. So it was women standing up to fight for their families, like Devora and Yael, uh, to the the fight right now in the Ukraine. Um, so I know that I haven't done this, but I know that there are sister Kihilot in Israel. We could certainly be involved with them. We could certainly support tourism and Aliyah and religious pluralism. Um, and when topics come up, we could write to our senators and representatives to support Israel. The other thing that I know is, um, Merkaz USA. That is the Zionist membership organization of the conservative movement. And it's the voice of conservative Jewry in the World Zionist Organization in the Jewish Agency. So it is a membership organization. So it, when the voting comes up, I know you have to pay a little bit, but if you could encourage your ladies to join and vote, that would be that would be something good to do. Um, then I was thinking about the planet. And I know that at Shirat Hayam, I see them, they are, they have little gardens and they right out front of the synagogue and they are growing vegetables. So one thing to do is to grow heirloom seeds. I am sure they 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 donate these vegetables to the local food bank. Um, I know at Ohev Shalom, we just finished installing all these brand new lighting that were the LED bulbs. So, you know, educate, talk to your sisterhood about that. Maybe they can actually do it in their own homes. Maybe you'll get your synagogue to do that. Um, and be a little bit warmer in the summer and a little bit colder in the winter. Wear a sweater. It'll save you money, too, on your heating bill. Um, the other thing is global warming. If you start a tree planting campaign, encourage tree planting right on the grounds of the shul and in your local community. Always a good thing to do. Okay, then we can talk about um, more social action is community beautification. We just had um, the Har Nebo Cemetery clean up. So, you know, volunteer, if you can get the ladies out to volunteer to clean up neglected spaces, um, be it in your synagogue or in your immediate community. That's another idea. Um, um, there are organizations, local organizations that clean up local waterways. Maybe we would partner with one of those to go out for the day and pick up trash um, and educate your members about the ocean. You know, right at Shira Hayam, we're right there um, to eat sustainable fish, dispose of waste responsibly, um, clean up the beach reduce your plastic usage. I know in New Jersey, they no longer give out plastic bags. So you have to bring your own with you uh, to the markets. Um, I was thinking about animal welfare. Sometimes there are, you know, things hit the news about um, stopping the wildlife trade and keeping wild animals safe in their natural habitat. That's more like writing to your congressperson for that one. Um, but ha, huh, this morning, or maybe yesterday, look at this one. As animal intake outpaces adoption, Philly shelters and rescue groups are in crisis mode. So we could collect and donate critter supplies to animal rescue groups. That would be, you know, just like you have a meeting, everybody bring, uh, you know, a can of cat food or whatever. Um, you could send volunteers to walk shelter dogs. Uh, you could host pet adoption events. Um, just some ideas. We, we are still looking for more ideas to get involved. Um, so we, we have this concept called Tikkun Olam, repairing the world. 
And in the mission, it states, it is not upon you to finish the work, but you are not free to ignore it. So please share ideas with your sisterhoods. Thank you for coming. I'm going to open the discussion now um, with questions and comments from the chat with the help of Debbie and um, Debbie Zimmerman. And also, um, I invite you to share projects or programs that your sisterhood has done related to public policy and social action. So thank you. Okay, yes, Karen, Karen Cougar, uh, you're muted, there you go. Got you. I wanna thank you very much, Roberta and Debbie. And, and mostly I wanna thank you for uh, sharing uh, the resolutions section of the Women's League website because resolutions are a personal interest of mine. And um, actually um, for Women's League International, I'm the co-chair of the Resolutions and Public Policy Committee. So I just wanted to mention to everybody that we're an active committee. We are working on a new resolution right now on um, social, uh, excuse me, justice and prison reform. Um, we meet, we discuss, we write resolutions. Um, and um, I wanted everybody to know that that process is a very open, transparent process. Anybody in any sisterhood has an idea for a resolution, uh, we'd love to hear it. If you wanna try your hand at writing a resolution, we can help you with the, you know, where to put the commas and the, and the, and the uh, semicolons. We're delighted to do that. So if anybody has a, an interest in resolutions, we are, we are here. And very briefly, um, you might be interested to know that because we no longer um, wait until uh, our convention to debate and discuss the resolutions, there is a process. And the process is the committee writes a resolution. It goes to the International Executive Committee the International Executive Committee will pass on it and say, great, uh, the way it is. Normally that doesn't happen. They have comments and thoughts and ideas. The, the committee takes that back. They, they think again, they write again, they incorporate, goes back to the Executive Committee. When we finally get the okay uh, from the International Executive Committee, the resolution then um, it, is um, announced to the International Board of Directors for their, for their edification and information, but they don't vote on it. It is the membership of Women's League, the total membership that gets to vote yes or no on the resolution. So we publish the resolution in the Women's League Week. We ask for comments. We real, the committee really does read the comments and we answer questions that are asked in the comments. If the comments uh, mention something that is we, that we didn't think of, that we think would really enhance the resolution, we, we use those comments to do some rewrites and things like that. And then finally, the resolution goes for uh, back to the um, uh, Women's League Week and it's published for several weeks and everybody in Women's League gets a chance to vote. We usually, we don't get that many votes. I mean, we're, we're an organization of thousands of women and we usually get a couple hundred votes. So um, I would suggest that the next time we, we publish one of our resolutions, take a look, comment, vote, ask your friends and other members of your sisterhood to do the same. We want your input and we want your interest in these important issues of the day. That's my speech. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Karen. Very interesting. Yeah, I, um, I, I did see a thing flash. We have about five minutes. Uh, so if anybody would like to, yeah, Rochelle, is that you? Go ahead, unmute. I just want to thank Karen for explaining the, the current way of doing it. I remember a hundred years ago, actually about 50 years ago, when I went to my first convention, uh, 
And for many years after that, uh, resolutions were discussed at convention and voted on by the delegates at convention. And it sometimes it got to be a knockdown drag out battle uh, between the women. And, and it happened like right before installation and everybody had to run up to their rooms and get all dressed up for the uh, installation. And uh, they didn't wanna leave the resolution section because they were so involved. So that was one of the things that really drew me to coming to conventions all the time. It was fabulous, but I like the new way. It's a little more, shall we say, civilized, but it, it's very good. Thank you, Karen, for explaining that. You know, if you, if you do um, take Roberta's suggestion and read through these resolutions, they really are interesting. Roberta's right. It is a historical timeline. And what will make you very proud is that this organization has been on the right side of history. You know, we made our statements in the, in the heat of the moment, in whatever issue was current. And now you can look back 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you can say, we were right. That feels good. You know, that feels good and that motivates you to keep doing it, so. Yeah, thank you, Karen, for, for your good work on that. Yeah, Barbara, we're glad to see you back. Thank yes. you. You're so <laughs> safe and sound, I appreciate it. I, 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 this is, do we have, how many minutes do we have? Because I don't want to open up a can of worms here if we don't have it. But here, I'll just put it out there. Maybe we can discuss it with someone offline. So we've been involved. I, I, I found always found Women's League to be, the like just said, the forefront, gun violence, education, immigration. And I am a little unclear why it's Judaism says the fetus doesn't start until birth and it's protecting the woman's life. Why? And I was in the car, so I apologize if I didn't hear why are we not permitted to take a stand um, on 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 you know our position that Roe v. Wade should not have been overturned? And maybe everybody doesn't agree with that, but um, I don't know. I can, do you have a minute to shed a little bit more light? I I I, I threw me. I I was a little bit uh, surprised that we didn't have that right. If that's our Torah and our Talmud interpretation, thank you. I, I, I think I, I might be able to clarify just a little bit more. I was surprised and shocked as well, which is um, why we reached out to Debbie, who I don't think is- um, and, She's you know, not with us. She's no longer on, on our-, on our We're for session. another session, yeah. Um, yeah. But she explained, right or wrong, that our 501c3 is, is that of a religious organization and religious organizations according to Debbie, are not allowed to take a political stand. So if we take a political stand, I, I know, I know. The, so the eyes roll. Is a political stand. I, I, I know that you know, the Catholic Church takes a political stand, but if we side with, you know, we go against the Supreme Court, then that's taking a political stand and we are not allowed to do that. So she urged everybody to do it personally, to do it as an affiliate, as an affiliate, which I don't understand because if we're an affiliate of a larger organization, why can we do that? But our parent organization, according to Debbie, is not allowed to do that and places it in the hands of the individuals and the other organizations that, that she uh, mentioned, Hadassah and um, I forget what other organizations that are better at that or are allowed to do that. Whether we agree or not, Barbara. Barbara, Barbara um, yeah, I, I, I also have had conversation with Debbie and with Rabbi Valensfield over this issue because in, in my capacity as uh, part of the resolutions committee, because Women's League has written four resolutions uh, in during the life of Roe v. Wade, we've written four resolutions in support of a woman's right to choose and a woman's right to bodily autonomy and then a new resolution on women's health that is doesn't really mention abortion, but you could maybe put it in that category too. So we have spoken over and over and over again. 
It is absolutely clear what the position of this organization is. However, we cannot endorse candidates. No. We cannot endorse political parties. We're not doing that. I and did we, did yeah, we we're not allowed to do that. 53? I thought we did. And, and so we can't endorse candidates. We cannot endorse political parties. No, I know, uh, but this, right. is, this is not a candidate or political party. This is a point, this is a theological point of view as well as a personal, not just sometimes about choice, it's about autonomy making decisions, not allowing lawmakers to take the right to make a decision and about a woman's future. It, I, mean, I don't want to. This, or, this organization's leadership has made a decision that we're not, we're not going to wade into those waters as Debbie and, and Roberta said, and as Debbie Goldich said, we can do it as individuals, we can do it as sisterhoods in keeping with the rules of our own shuls and in consultation with our rabbis. This organization will not be leading us in this campaign. And that that is the position of Women's League. At thank the you. Moment. Listen, thank I you. want to thank everybody for coming. Great. Welcome and thank you for choosing and attending the Torah Fund session of our 2022 training. Thank you to Maddie Gimbel, International Vice Chair Communication and Torah Fund Director Stella Ann Bornstein, Ann Millman and Lynn Stein for attending. We have guests from the Garden State region and thank them for joining us, including Sue Romanoff, Garden State Torah Fund Vice President, past branch president, Sandy Birnbaum and Faye Labison, and past region president, Lori Snow. Everyone I believe is muted and our Karen will mute everybody. So that you have it, my email address is sjls at comcast.net. And you will see that email address on a bi-weekly basis in the constant contact article that I write for the region. Please, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, or just want to touch base with me, get in touch. Some of you might be wondering about my hat. This is all my collected Torah fund pins. I wish this had been my idea, but I have to give credit to incoming Torah fund chair, Gretchen Kotkin, from CBT for wearing an absolutely stunning Torah Fund hat at their recent event where she was honored. And in fact, if anybody has a chance to see Gretchen this evening, she is wearing that same beautiful hat. So what is Torah Fund? Torah Fund is the dedicated philanthropy for Women's League. We are the lucky people who provide the monies for the training of our future rabbis, cantors, educators, and leaders. And we're happy and proud to do it. Torah Fund is celebrating its 80th year. It began in 1942. And in the beginning, we helped to fund the Kripke Tower, Women's League Sanctuary Synagogue, Matilda Schechter Residence Hall, Goldsmith Residence Hall, where my son resided when he was in joint program, Residence Hall at AJU, JTS Library Bookshelves, and the Schechter Institute Garden. Recently, we are now providing funding to the five institutions for scholarships, JTS in New York, Ziegler in Los Angeles, the Schechter Institute in Israel, the Seminario Rabbinico Latino Americano in Buenos Aires, and the newest institute, the Zacharias Frankel College in Potsdam, Germany. So there are various ways for you to contribute towards Torah Fund. Our general campaign this year is Chazak via Matz, and it provides funding for the five institutions I just listed. Creating new spaces has a target goal of raising $200,000 with more than halfway there for a study space at JTS Residence Hall, which will be handicap accessible and environmentally sensitive and a gender and harassment awareness program at Ziegler. 
Carol Simon is the contact person for that program. Please remember that contributions towards creating spaces do not count towards your sisterhood goal. That is a specific standalone program, but are very worthy donations. Think about a donation to creating new spaces in honor of a young woman or recent graduate. In addition to these programs, we also have instituted a new program called Plus 80, where we are asking that in honor of Torah Fund's 80th anniversary, that you generously add $80 to your usual donation. If in fact this is done, please note that on a note on the check that's going to Torah Fund and on the transmittal form because those plus 80 donors will be recognized at convention 2023. The Legacy Society is a way to raise money by an estate contribution, which can be in the form of an IRA, insurance policy, et cetera. Forms need to be completed and a professional advisor should be consulted. For those who have committed to a donation to the Legacy Society, a charm will be given that attaches to every Torah fund pin. And Kathy Swerdlow and Marsha Topple are the contacts. And if anybody is interested in the Legacy Society, please see me and I will provide those emails or you can copy them down from the screen. Reasons to donate to the Legacy Society. Commitment to Jewish values. Research indicates that in 20 years, legacy donations will need to be 20 to 25% of operating budgets to meet obligations. Stocks, bonds, retirement, life insurance, or IRAs may be utilized, as well as a portion of the estate. Any amount can be designated. The amount can be changed if circumstances change. And if you don't want to incur the expense of changing an estate or a trust, Torah Fund can be a designated beneficiary for a product such as an IRA or life insurance, which is a much easier way to facilitate this. Money will go to support the institution's Torah Fund supports, just like the general campaign. And again, always consult a professional for advice. So who are the people and the institutions that support Torah Fund? Well, obviously the Women's League Sisterhoods and Affiliates, the Torah Fund Chairs, who are the worthy volunteers for those affiliates, affiliate presidents and affiliate Torah Fund committees. These are the uh, Torah Fund Vice Presidents for the 13 regions. You will see me under Mid-Atlantic Region. And again, there's my email address which you will see constantly. And we are fortunate enough to have the Garden State Vice President, Sue Romanoff with us today as well. You really will not have contact with the other uh, Torah Fund region uh, Vice Presidents. It's pretty much gonna be me, but here they are um, just so you know who they are. Okay, this is our international Torah Fund leadership. Obviously, Debbie Kaner Goldich is our president who just spoke. Barbara Ezring is the International Torah Fund Chair. Janet does the money. Maddie does the talking. And we're lucky and fortunate to have her here. Randy is our Canadian liaison. And Laura is, Lauren is our advisor. So again, um, I feel like I'm not doing my job if you're going to them. If you have any question, comment, complaint, issue, frustration, whatever's going on, please reach out to me first. I pride myself on providing excellent customer service. I am an email hound and I will be watching, looking and answering um, your requests and questions. And if I don't have the answer, I'm very good at getting it. I think Maddie will attest to that. Now, this is our Torah Fund paid staff. Lisa Paul is the Torah Fund Director and Cheryl Moss Solomon is the Finance Manager. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost a Torah Fund employee 
Um, Meg Morrison, who was a, an excellent Torah Fund employee, has moved on. And so I ask that you be patient with our Torah Fund paid staff. They are doing yeoman's work to continue and keep up with all the responsibilities of Torah Fund. Again, if you do have a Torah Fund finance issue, please come to me first. Please give me the chance to research it and solve it. And we will go to Cheryl together if I cannot figure it out. Oh, this is really important. The Torah Fund office is at JTS 3080 Broadway, New York, New York 10027. The Torah Fund office has not moved. I can't reiterate that enough. The Women's League office has moved. The Torah Fund office has not. This is the address where it is and will remain. This is the address that is on your transmittal form. And this is the address where Torah Fund donations should be sent. Okay, so how does Torah Fund raise money? Most of you, I think, already know this. In terms of donor giving levels, we will get into more detail about that later. Um, we have a wonderful e-card program. We have um, specific um, it, hard copy greeting cards as well. We support Torah Fund events on the affiliate and region level. There are spectacular videos and you will see um, a link to that so that you can use those videos in your own affiliate Torah Fund events. They are everything from Shuli Rubin Schwartz. Rabbi Galinkin just has a new one. There are ones from the different seminaries all around the world. There are various lengths. They are really inspiring and a wonderful way to use them in the form of a Devar Torah. They're really terrific. Um, to the Torah Fund office provides e-blast newsletters and bulletins. And there are many, many campaign letters that you will find in the Torah Fund um, campaign guide and other writings that come out throughout the year. So this is an example of Torah Fund events. The first one would be an affiliate event where the affiliate is honoring people. In this case, they're honoring four different people. The middle one is a region Torah Fund event. And the one on the far right would be if the affiliate wants to have a speaker from JTS or Ziegler come and speak at an affiliate Torah Fund event. I am pleased to report that the Torah Fund event for our region, the Mid-Atlantic region, is going to be November 6th of 2022. It will be a brunch luncheon. The location, if we're allowed to have it live, will be Tefereth Israel of Lower Bucks County in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania, my affiliate, which has been very gracious in agreeing to host and cater. Uh, we really, really want to have a live event and hope we can, but we do understand that if we can't, that we will have a Zoom event and it may be a hybrid event as well. The topic for our Torah Fund event is the working uh, topic and subject is Torah teachings towards transformation and transcendence, how a therapist rabbi uses Torah and faith in counseling and improving mental health. We felt that with all of the mental health challenges and difficulties during COVID, that this would be a very interesting topical and different topic. And we are really looking forward to having you join us. And again, hoping that we can meet in person. If you are interested in being on the event committee, please reach out to me. I would love to have your input and your help. And we are really looking forward to a terrific event. So if you are interested in securing a student speaker from Ziegler, you contact Rabbi Brad Artson, and it's Bartson, you know, Brad Artson at aju.edu. To request a rabbinical or cantorial speaker from JTS, you contact Lisa Paul. This is her email address. And again, you'll find it all over the Torah Fund campaign guide. You don't really need to write that down. From personal experience, I will tell you that if you are going to contact Lisa for a speaker, 
please give her three months notice. Um, it's a challenge sometimes to get the young students to respond back to her and she wants to provide um, the best possible service that she can. She will ask you for the theme of the event, the time of day of the event, where the speaker fits into the program, i.e. the beginning, the middle, the end, the approximate time of day that the student will speak, the length of the anticipated presentation. So if you think the student should speak for half an hour or leave time for questions, she'll wanna know that as well. She will ask, will there be questions and the expected number of attendees. If you can provide her that information in your initial contact, it's just one less email going back and forth, but she will be asking you for that information. I will tell you that uh, my affiliate is scheduled, has scheduled their Torah Fund event in March of 2023, and we have already reached out to Lisa for our speaker, and she has secured one for us. The sooner you know your date, the sooner you can do it, the better you'll sleep at night and the easier it'll be. So this is our new Torah Fund pin that Debbie showed us the in-person version during her talk. Pins will be distributed from the Torah Fund office and um, the Torah Fund office has already reached out to uh, people and for volunteers for pin packing. I am going to do it Wednesday the 17th, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of that week. They are looking for a pin packer volunteers. So you will see that it is anticipated that the pins will be sent out soon. Associate patron and hire. So that's a $600 donation and higher. Those are sent individually by the Torah Fund office. Um, Affiliates are going to be receiving pins based on their previous donors. So there's no need to order pins. The Torah Fund office is going to look at how many pins your affiliate received previously and act accordingly. If, God willing, you expect a big increase in the number of donors and the number of pins you will need, please let me know so I can give the Torah Fund office a heads up. And again, the distribution will be um, this summer. During the Torah Fund cabinet meeting, Rabbi Artson gave the Devar Torah, and he spoke so beautifully about our Torah Fund theme that I just wanted to share a little bit of what he said with you. So he describes the Chazak Viamat's theme as um, both words as be strong synonyms. This phrase, phrase has a huge biblical resonance as stated by Moses to Joshua when turning over leadership. Imagine Joshua's trepidation in succeeding Moses. Joshua needed this encouragement. God uses this phrase four times in speaking with Joshua and King David said this to his son King Solomon as well. Rabbi Artin then looked to the Talmud and described Chazak. We are going from Torah learning to life in every generation and finding our inner resilient strength. Rabbi Artson tells us about um, his mentor, Rabbi Dr. Simon Greenberg's words that we can't live our grandparents' Torah, but that it's not our own decision either, that it's a continuing light dialogue. For Amatz, he describes the word as acts of kindness, goodness, and generosity. It's not just words on a page, but our actions. Reach out to isolated women as we do in Women's League. For students, stand with Israel and gently encourage Israel to, do, to be the best version of herself. So here are some um, documents that I wanted to call your attention to. The Torah Fund Campaign Guide is basically the how-to of Torah Fund. When I was first starting out last year, this really became my Bible for all things Torah Fund. There will be a new version uh, for 2022-23. It's not out yet, but please take a look at the one from 2021-22 because you will find introductions in, and leadership and operations, timelines and checklists, speeches, 
fundraising, thank you, Torah fund speeches, legacy society solicitation, legacy society speech, creating new spaces solicitation, creating new spaces speech, contributions, um, information about requesting a speaker, and, and just a wealth of information. The only changes really that I wanna make is obviously the theme is different. And in any place where it says to contact Meg Morrison, do not contact Meg Morrison because she's not there. Just contact Torafund at jtsa.edu and your inquiry will be addressed and attended to. Chaya showed is the Torah Fund magazine, which comes out seasonally. And I am pleased to be a writer for Chaya Show. Please read it. It's a wonderful um, cheerleading tool for Torah Fund. It provides excellent information about our members, our programs, and is just really um, a wonderful way to instill enthusiasm for Torah Fund. And this last um, Torah Fund um, little block is to access the videos. You don't need to copy this down. If you have any interest in these videos, please see me. The videos are semi-secret in the sense that Torah Fund does not want them all out there to all people. There are a limited number of them. It's hard to produce them. And we really want them used for um, region and affiliate Torah Fund events. So it's kind of like a semi-hidden page. If you are interested in viewing the videos and choosing one, um, please get in touch with me and I will send you the link. Now, um, for a Torah Fund letter to your affiliate, please look in the guide. I just did a Torah Fund letter to, um, for my affiliate. If you are interested in seeing mine as a guide, please let me know and I am happy to share that with you. And um, for new Torah Fund chairs, a volunteer data form should be completed I sent a volunteer data form to the four new Torah Fund chairs that I'm aware of. If you're a new Torah Fund chair and I did not send it to you, please let me know and I will send you one. If you need transmittal forms, please go to the Torah Fund guide, go to the operations section, click on campaign materials link, scroll down and you will find the transmittal form or again, you can just come to me. I have it readily accessible and I will send you a transmittal link. Um, transmittal form, obviously I want you to keep one um, handy so that you can just keep making copies of them when you're hopefully sending in so many of your Torah Fund contributions. So this was our Torah Fund Stands with Israel program this year. There were three of them. And they're wonderful. Usually there will be a Devar Torah by um, a rabbi from one of the institutions, and there will be a speaker from the Israeli embassy, a diplomat. Um, they've been really awe-inspiring, providing great information. I've been fortunate enough to be writing about them for Chadashot magazine. So if you miss at the actual presentation. Sometimes they're allowed to be recorded, sometimes they're not, depending on um, the sensitivity of the speaker. And um, But you can always read about them in uh, Chadashot. I hope to continue writing about Torah Fund Stands with Israel program for a long time in the future. Torah Fund e-cards. Torah, Torah Fund e-cards and Torah Fund paper greeting cards. These are additional ways to make money for Torah Fund and make money for um, your affiliate in terms of reaching your goal. Physical actual cards are available at this time. The policy is now that payment must accompany the order. This can be done in the following ways. You can print and mail a physical order form with a check for payment to the Torah Fund office email the form and mail a check to the Torah Fund office with cards in the memo, email the form and make payment online with a credit card at the Torah Fund online site. 
to keep things easiest, I think the easiest way to do it is to just print a copy of the order form, enclose the check, and return it to the Torah Fund office. Um, we would like you to encourage donors to use the e-cards, which are available now. There are many different ones. They are beautiful. A cost of an e-card is $5, and your affiliate will receive credit for e-cards purchased at the end of the campaign year. A donation to the Torah Fund General Campaign is also credited to the affiliate account and counts towards goal. So if you want to make a donation in honor or, or memory of somebody, that donation will also count towards your goal. But remember, if you make a donation to creating new spaces, it's a wonderful um, goal and um, uh, um, to do so, but that does not count towards your Torah Fund goal. So at this point, I want to um, talk about some tips for a smooth transaction. And again, the address of the Torah Fund office is not Women's League. Please don't send correspondence to Women's League. It will just delay matters. Torah Fund is located at 3080 Broadway, New York, New York, 10027, as indicated on the transmittal form. The office is not open on Friday, Jewish or federal holidays. And we recommend that you send all donations with tracking, not a return receipt. Because of the days that the office is closed, Friday or Saturday, it's best if you send it with, track, with tracking. Now, we recognize that sending something priority mail with tracking is expensive. It can cost as much as $9 to send a letter with tracking. And quite frankly, if you're sending an $18 donation and it costs $9 to mail it, you know, that may be a difficult pill to swallow. So I did go to my post office and don't ask me why the post office works this way. Um, the vagaries of the post office um, are beyond my pay grade. But if you send a small package within 16 ounces, as long as it has rigid sides, it counts as a package, not as a letter. It comes with tracking and you can send that for as little as 450. There are also ways to um, utilize the USPS online link that has tracking that may be cheaper. And if your sisterhood or uh, synagogue has like a Pitney Bowes system or any other kind of mailing system, please inquire if you can use it and reimburse um, your synagogue if need be because the tracking may be cheaper utilizing one of those systems. And that actually came from the postal clerk when I went to inquire about the cheapest way to send something with tracking. Try to schedule delivery so that it doesn't get there on a Friday weekend or a holiday. Checks must be made payable to Torah Fund. Checks need to be complete with the Torah Fund transmittal form. Keep a copy for yourself and send one to me. I can't impress enough how I want a copy of that transmittal form. I know that some affiliates will not do it. I know. I mean, out of the 29 affiliates for the Mid-Atlantic region, I will have to say that less than half send me their transmittal forms. And I honestly have to tell you that I think that that's a real mistake. Um, this, this year alone, my first year in Torah Fund, I had a lot of circumstances where the total amount that the affiliate thought they had contributed and the amount the Torah Fund thought they had contributed were not the same. If I have your transmittal form, I can go through it and see if I can figure out the discrepancy. If you speak with my husband, he will tell you how I would sit pouring over the transmittals and pouring over the reports and matching them person by person to figure out where the errors were. If I don't have the transmittal, I cannot do that. So please at least consider sending me the transmittal. You don't have to send it by mail, scan it, send it to me by email. I will print it out. I will make a copy. I have a whole, I keep a whole folder of them every year. And it's just another layer and another way to have another set of eyes 
looking at it to make sure that we can figure out any issues or problems or discrepancies. Keep a copy of each check for your sisterhood file. If you'd like, you can send me the checks. Most people don't. Um, and, you know, maybe your donors wouldn't want me to have, you know, copies of their bank accounts or whatever. As long as you have copies of the check, that's really fine with me. Double check the amount written on the check to make sure it's the same amount on the transmittal. Examine the checks for signature, number amount matching written amount, check made payable to Torah fund. Is the check legible? If not, please contact the donor for correction or rewritten checks. Is your donor a sisterhood member, a new member, another sisterhood member, an individual Women's League member, unaffiliated? If the donor is not a member of your sisterhood, make a note of any of the other categories on your transmittal form. Something came up several times this year that I want to address. And that's that the Torah Fund office is only going to attribute one affiliate per person. So that if somebody has indicated that their donation to, should go to a specific affiliate years and years ago and never updated it, Torah Fund is going to have that donation going to that affiliate. And we had some circumstances with our Center City uh, Synagogue this year where people had moved from the suburbs to Center City, didn't update their Torah Fund designation, and the Torah Fund office had that donation going to an affiliate that that person no longer belonged to. You cannot correct that. I cannot correct that. The only person who can correct that is that person herself. And she needs to do that by sending a written letter or an email to the Torah Fund office and saying, I now want my Torah Fund donations to be attributed to X affiliate. We had several issues this year where a donation did not show up on, um, on the report because it was attributed to another sisterhood. Also, if you have a situation where you're having a Torah Fund event and a a dignitary or somebody, a, a guest is coming from another affiliate, that donation that they make is gonna go to their own affiliate and not to your affiliate. If you want it to go to your affiliate because you want to use their donation to help you make gold, the suggestion would be to have them make the check to your sisterhood and then your sisterhood turns around and sends a check to Torah Fund. And then that check from your affiliate gets attributed to your sisterhood. We had some hard feelings where dignitaries came from other affiliates and the um, hosting affiliate was hoping that the Torah Fund donation would go to them and it did not. So that's a way to handle that situation. Be cognizant of important dates, mid-December to get end of year tax donations in and mid-June to get the fiscal year Torah Fund donations in. It's best if all donations are um, sent to Torah Fund no later than mid-June. The Torah Fund fiscal year is June 30th, but please don't cut it that close. As I indicated, the Torah Fund office is short staffed and the JTS data managers are short staffed as well. Please make their lives easier, make your own life easier by making sure that the donation is attributed to this campaign and get it in um, by mid-June. The Torah Fund office was a little bit behind in getting their receipts out, but that is now getting resolved as well. Now, with credit card donations, obviously it's preferred if, if donations are made online, um, the donor gets an immediate receipt. The Torah Fund office gets the money that much sooner. It's really safe. And then a credit card donation obviously can be made on, online. Uh, credit card donations should not be made on transmittal forms and do not send a credit card number through the mail or leave it on a voicemail system. 
If you want to make a credit card donation by phone, call the Torah Fund office, speak to Cheryl Moore Solomon, and give her personally the credit card number. Do not leave it as a message on an answering machine. Now, sisterhood aggregate checks. Torah Fund will accept the sisterhood aggregate check. I just indicated a circumstances where you might need to use a sisterhood aggregate check. Um, it will be accepted. It's not recommended. Per International Torah Fund Chair Barbara Ezring, reasons being Torah Fund will be unable to send charitable donation confirmation under those circumstances. The Sisterhood Synagogue would then be responsible for issuing a tax receipt. The office will not add those individual names to the Torah Fund donor base. This means that the donors do not receive emails from Torah Fund, Chada Shots, or eBlast, including the Rosh Hashanah greeting. I know that some sisterhoods collect their Torah Fund monies that way. They send out a bill late summer, early fall for dues. They also send out a request for Torah Fund donations. They collect it all at once and they send it out. We recognize that. We understand some sisterhoods work that way, but that is not the preferred way to do it. So I just wanted to um, go back a little bit and talk about our new pin and the um, levels of donating. So the, um, at, as you know, you're not buying a pin. At certain levels, Torah Fund gifts you a pin. And the lowest level is the benefactor level of 180. A guardian is the next level up. Associate patron is 600, at which point the Torah Fund office sends out the pins and not you. Patron 1200, scholarship patron 2500, Keter Kavod 5000. I don't know. Um, Karen, can you show the, the last flyer, the picture of the pin? At the end, there it is. So I don't know about you, but everybody that I have spoken to or has spoken to me about the pin really likes it, but says that this pin says chaza, but it also says pin in English. So I came up with a little slogan for this pen, which reads as follows. From right to left, we are strong and courageous. Left to right, celebrate our 80 year pin. Support for our students is so advantageous. Your Torah Fund gift lets the learning begin. So that's my slogan for Torah Fund this year. And I think we can be, you know, a little lighthearted about it because if you look at this pin, it says pin. And I've never seen another Torah Fund pin that has an English interpretation. So that's my slogan. I will share it. Feel free to use it. Um, pin and donation issue. Some women are upset that they don't receive the full amount of their donation for IRS purposes and the value of the pin is deducted. This is not a Women's League issue. This is an IRS issue. And if somebody wants to get the specifics, it's IRS topic 506 publication, charitable donation, which states, if you receive a benefit in exchange for the contribution, you can only deduct the amount that exceeds the fair market value of the benefit received. Luckily, the value of the Torah Fund pin is not very much. Um, insofar as Women's League is concerned, of course, to us, they're priceless. But if anybody questions you about um, the reason they're not getting a $180 donation uh, receipt or a $300, that is the reason it has nothing to do with to uh, Torah Fund or Women's League. That is IRS. So at this point, I am done with my presentation, but I also promised everybody that we would talk a little strategy. And I want to call on Lori Snow, our immediate past region president, to talk a little bit about how her 
affiliate literally revitalized their Torah fund this year. As Lori saw in virtually every report that I sent them, I would write to them, this report makes my heart sing because they have done such an amazing turnaround job. And I thought we would all benefit from hearing from Lori to see how it was done. Lori. Thank you for your kind words, Shelley. Um, my sisterhood had a tough time during COVID. So this was our first event that we were doing in person in a long time. And we really had no one to honor, which is something that my little sisterhood has faithfully done every year and done very well. So we decided we would honor all the women that had donated 20 years or more. So a personal contact was made with each of those women. So they all came and they all made donations and they all got pins. And some of them um, we thought might bring some relatives and things like that. Well, we had a wonderful turnout, a great event, and we raised more money than we had in years because it made so many people feel special. So when you don't know what to do, keep this idea in mind and it worked very well for us. Now, Lori, you had that at somebody's house or backyard, correct? Yes, um, our tradition is to have a luncheon at someone's house. And we try to pick people that have a beautiful house because um, people got to expect that they get to go somewhere lovely each, each year. And um, people would people bring food, the host usually prepare the main, the main course. And um, this, this particular woman had a beautiful backyard. So we, we, um, we had a speaker, actually uh, one of our um, congregants has spending six months of the year in Israel. And she talked to us on good old Zoom and we were all in person, and we got to hear about what it was like to live as a Masorti Jew in, in Jerusalem. So we had a little talk, and she talked about Torah Fund as well, so it fit right in the theme. Then we had a lovely lunch, and we I wrote a little, um, little talk to honor the women for what they have supported and contributed to for all these years, and read that, and we gave everybody um, a flower made them feel special. And it was just a lovely, lovely day. So women felt good about themselves. They raised yes. money for Torah Fund. The affiliate feels good about itself, that its Torah Fund is revitalized. All is good in the world. That's right. Well put, Shell. <laughs> yeah. I, I find that the personal approach really works the best. And so I'm going to ask all of you, please invite me, please. I will come, you know, to speak on Zoom. I will come to speak in person. I will come to speak at an affiliate Torah fund event. I have this down to five minutes, if you want, to make my pitch. Um, I think you can tell I'm kind of an enthusiastic person. And the, the times when I got invited this year, and I got invited to some affiliates to tell the truth that had not been involved with Torah Fund before. I am really pleased to say that they've made goal. There was increased enthusiasm. I think they were happy to hear from me. Um, one in particular didn't really know a lot about Torah Fund and what we even did. So the personal approach works. And, you know, this is why I'm wearing this hat because I plan to wear it to high holidays and other events. I want people to ask Shelly, why are you wearing that hat? It will give me a chance to talk about Torah Fund and the pins. So please, you know, if, if there's any event coming up, you know, uh, whatever event you have going on that you think I could fit in as a five minute speaker and you want to invite me, please do. I'd love to see all of you have the success that Lori did. And I really do think that, you know, the personal approach is, um, is what does it. If I can call on in like the two minutes we have left, Sandy Birnbaum, are you still there? Are you here? I'm here. Okay. Sandy Birnbaum is from my affiliate and she is the consummate Torah fund asker. She can get people to contribute and contribute beautifully when 
in a way that no one else can. So if you would just share some of your pearls of wisdom, Sandy, in how you do it. When I look at our um, sisterhood, which is not a big sisterhood, we have 60 members and how many women we have contributing to Torah Fund on a really nice, healthy level, I can attribute that to our Sandy Birnbaum, who is queen of the ask. So can you tell us a little bit of how you do that? First of all, you can't be afraid to approach someone. That's number one. And when you approach someone, just put a smile on your face and tell them all about what Shelly just said in a elevator speech, like 30 seconds to a minute. You don't want to overwhelm them and let them know how important it is for the future of conservative Judaism. I go up to everyone at services. Um, you know, I'm not bashful. I go up and I talk to the men and I say, would you like to contribute and donate money to the Jewish Theological Seminary. I tell them what it's for. And one man, one husband buys, uh, not buys, but he makes a donation every year. And on their anniversary, he gives his wife the pin. Another man does the same thing. And, you know, you don't know until you ask someone. And Ann Millman, I have to say, has created something that's very interesting. My sister at Tiferet Israel has game day every Monday and they put a pishka on every table and they collected enough money, no and what? And unmute, unmute. When I go around to collect the, the money for, for game day, um, it, usually it's, it's $4. And a lot of time um, people have a five. So then they give, I, I walk with the box. <laughs> I walk around each table with the box and they give me, they give me the extra dollar and, and it adds up. And it, it added it, up. Yeah. It added, it, it up. added up to a hundred and hundred and eighty one dollars uh, for last year. So, uh, so we had a drawing of the, for, uh, for a pin and, uh, and the person who won was so thrilled that she is going to be uh, making a substantial um, donation now for a Torah fund. Uh, in, in addition to the dollar that she gives every week. Donations are only limited by our imagination. Absolutely. And unfortunately, we have, to, we have to wrap this up. I could talk about Torah Fund for you know, another hour. Please reach out to me. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I am thrilled that all of you came. We had the most people come to our session. So I'm very, very happy about that. And I am available to help. I'm a shoulder uh, to cry on if you need it. And um, please reach out to me and please invite me because I really want to participate with you and, you know, and come meet your members. And I just want to add one more thing. As Shelly said, we have a very small sisterhood. We have 22 benefactors and above. So there's nothing impossible. Just be happy, be enthusiastic, and don't be afraid to ask people. The worst they can say is no, or I'll think about it, and you get back to them. It's really very simple. Rest with a smile on your face and don't take no for an answer. <laughs> there you go, you see? <laughs> and on that note, I think Karen has to close our room. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Shelly. Um, Beth and I are the co-presenters, Beth Chernoff and Ariana Burrows. Um, we want to welcome you to the breakout session that will highlight skills and best practices for fiscal officers, data managers, membership officers, and others who are interested in an introduction to these skills and uh, practices. 
and if any of our, um, um, we'll see whether any of the people from the Garden State region join us. We certainly would welcome them as well. We're thrilled to have all of you with us this evening. I am a past president of my um, sisterhood affiliate, Melrose B'nai Israel Emmanuel in Elkins Park, and a past president of that congregation. I have been region treasurer for the past four years, and I serve on the Women's League International Board and on a couple of that board's committees. Professionally, I worked in nonprofits for several decades, but I've been retired for the last few years. And I am Beth Chernoff from Temple Sinai in Dresher, Pennsylvania. Um, I was a sisterhood co-president and region communications person in the last administration. Now I am the membership vice president called, officially called membership and sisterhood support. I also serve on the communications and membership committees of Women's League International. I was a librarian for New Jersey state government for many years, and I work part-time for the federal government. And now we'd like to hear about you. So we're gonna go around, and I think we'll start with uh, Lena. We're gonna ask you to please say your name and your position with your affiliate sisterhood. And on top of your volunteer work for your sisterhood, please tell us if you're also employed or what your past employment has been. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Lena Shane, um, Temple Sinai, Cinnamons and Sisterhood. I'm the financials secretary. This is my second term. Um, I've been past president of another sisterhood and a past president of what was Southern New Jersey uh, region. Um, in my past life, I managed my husband's accounting practice, which uh, I, I've been retired for about 10 years. And... Um, that's about it. I'm like I'm liking to um, to still be involved, and I just hope that you know we can come up to the 21st century. Thank you, Lena. Pam. Hi, I'm Pam Adler. I'm a member of Temple Beth Sholem in Cherry Hill. This is my first position as financial secretary, my first year of my term. Um, I'm married. My husband and I are in the pharmacy business, Adler's Pharmacy in Cherry Hill. And Mark is my husband. And um, we have a daughter, Eliza. I'm fortunate enough to be in Long Beach Island for the summer with her as Mark works diligently at home and I work a little bit from, you know, the computer. Not too much. And uh, I forget what else you asked me, but that pretty much sums me up. Thank you, Deb. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pam. And now to Deb. Hello, uh, I'm Debbie Cotson. Uh, it's my first year as, oh, from uh, uh, Temple Beth Shalom in Cherry Hill. Uh, first year as the membership vice president. So definitely looking forward to anything I can learn uh, here from Women's League. I'm retired. I was a, a teacher for 37 years. And now uh, I'm enjoying being retired and uh, getting very involved with things to do with sisterhood. Thank you, Deb. Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Weinstock. I belong to Morristown Jewish Center, Beit Israel in Morristown, New Jersey. I am the financial secretary. I have had this position for uh, around two to three terms. Um, and prior to that, I had other sisterhood positions. Um, Pre-COVID, I was in large companies doing uh, IT work for 20 plus years, UPS, IBM, transportation, um, logistics. So now I am home with my family and being a mom and sisterhood, and I volunteer a lot with um, Metro West Federation. Thank and you, I Jennifer. help the schools. Thank you, Jennifer. And now our wonderful, indispensable 
communications person for Barbara Shirovsky. Indispensable, we'll find out. But I did figure out how to move people from one breakout section to another on the fly. So yay. Um, hi, I'm Barbara Shirovsky. I am a member of um, Bethel Voorhees. And I'm a past president of that sisterhood. And right now I am the Women's League liaison on, on our board. And for the region, I am the communications vice president. I do our, our constant contact newsletters. And um, I live here in Cherry Hill with my husband and one of my children who just refuses to move out. And um, I, I'm, I'm still working. I am a preschool director out of Israel on the main line. And um, anybody knows the bunny who's looking for a job for hiring. Um, that's my little commercial. And um, that's it about me. Great, very good. So I'm going to share our screen. Um, this first slide has email contact for Beth and me, should you want to reach us after this evening. And I assure you though, that as we move through our presentation, Beth and I will pause at times to take your questions. And we have budgeted time at the end for more discussion because we certainly realize that you also could well have knowledge that would be helpful to share with one another. So now I will begin and um, I start with, um, my view of the mission of fiscal officers. Support the implementation of the president's goals and provide unwavering stewardship of the sisterhood affiliates funds. Has your president ever said what her goals are? Ask her. Those goals can be a touchstone for your sisterhood's budget as well as your activities and events during the year. I remember a question once about an expenditure a president wanted, and I advocated that this expense would move us forward on an important goal. Knowing your president's goals and bringing in others to share with that perception promotes cohesion, and a, a sense of purpose for the entire group, which is uplifting and helps to energize volunteers who are so valuable to us all. Um, the other half of the mission I showed you was stewardship of the funds. And I recommend that you be involved in your sisterhood's annual budget planning. You'll hear the thinking behind the figures and also you can have input on inclusion of budget items. I'll mention some examples of these a bit later. In addition to the annual sisterhood budget, you should get copies of project budgets well before expenditures are made for the event or activity. Even better is to help in planning the project budget because sometimes the project chair or the members of the committee may not think of a necessary item or realize its cost. You also can have input on payment deadlines. So the payment process remains under control and you don't get too harried. For myself, I like to think back from the event date to my drop dead deadline. And then I suggest a deadline published on the flyer that's a few days earlier, which gives me the bulk of the responses in good time, but also the ability to include and welcome those inevitable last minuteers. Are there any questions or comments so far? Of um, best practices, what we'll look at um, are your records, deposits, non-check payments, and credit cards. Regarding your records, of course you keep records of all monies received and um, due to your sisterhood. Show of hands, who uses Quicken? Anybody use Quicken? Anybody use QuickBooks? 
We use a manual logbook to keep track of um, your monies coming in or co going out or a spreadsheet. What is your, unmute yourself and tell me what you use, how you keep track. Pam and Lena. Um, that, that's actually, I believe our treasurer's job. So I haven't uh, experienced that myself. Okay, do you know what what your what um your treasurer what your treasurer uses? Um, I'm not really sure. It could be Quicken or QuickBooks. Uh, I talked to her briefly about that. Um, I'm not 100. percent She also is new. We just you know had a whole turnaround of officers, so okay. I'm not sure. If she I'm has any any her. any questions come up, she can always call me. And you have I, know, I, took, I took down your email address. Email. I, I did text her and asked her if she was going to be able to attend, but she said she couldn't she couldn't attend the, the Zoom it, tonight. So some people have other obligations and vacation mm -hmm. and stuff. I know I know that. Right. So I understand. Lena, what what do you know what is used um in, in your sisterhood? No, it's the same situation. I'm not sure what um she uses. Um could be QuickBooks. I really don't know. Okay. Same and here for us. I don't know. I, I keep track of our work in um, a spreadsheet, but okay. I don't ever receive um, actual money. It's just I get a note of who has paid and that goes directly to the treasurer. The a spreadsheet is a there is a, um, a, a fine way to keep track. Um, the next one on the list was deposits. You, of course, you make timely deposit of the monies received because people like to balance their checkbook and they can get irritated if they have to carry a check over for the next month or the next month, next month. I am big on documentation. I make copies of checks before making a deposit and I use the automated drive through teller so I can opt for check images on the deposit slip. There are drawbacks though. Sometimes the automated teller spits out my checks and I have to um, you know, repeat inserting the checks into the drawer. But, um, and sometimes there have been um, twice in the last three years where there's been an incorrect um, amount on the deposit, but I have the copies of the checks, which I make before I make the deposit and I have the, check images on the deposit slip and the bank has always credited me for the correct amount after I, I put that um, to their attention. And of course you keep a file uh, marked deposits um, for each fiscal year. So you would put the uh, copies of checks if you make them stapled to the, um, to the deposit slip and that would go in your file. Non-check deposits, raise your hand if you of your sisterhood accepts direct payments to your bank. No, you're, or you're not aware of it. Um, I want to quote uh, Women's League directly on this issue. Women's League does not recommend using Venmo for using funds. Women's League has always recommended only connections between your affiliate email address and your bank account accounts through Venmo that don't have a fee are personal accounts and require you to connect your bank to the um, to, uh, your bank account to a personal cell phone. And so we don't recommend that, but we do recommend Zelle if you access Zelle through your affiliate bank account. You do not need to connect a person to a personal cell phone and the money comes directly from the payer to your account. But your uh, bank has to have Zelle. If your bank does not have Zelle, we don't recommend using it because then that would require a connection to your personal cell phone. And I think Lena, you had expressed some interest in Zell, so I uh, explored even further beyond the Women's League statement. Um, the first thing is to connect with your bank and check that they have Zell, and see what it, if they do, what is necessary in order to set that up because it does vary. 
for example, for the regions um, bank, bank, which does have Zelle, um, I just had to enroll in online banking and set up a profile and the payer would then use their Zelle and find our email or our profile. And then I would get an, a notification um, in my email and that would take maybe three to five days for that to happen. But Marcia Strongen, who is the international treasurer for Women's League, says that it's different for every bank. So that's why I would say, Lena, you should call your bank and, um, and see first that they have Zelle. And actually, some banks, um, I'm sorry for the, all of a sudden the sun has come out, some banks will help you set it up. Another recommendation that Martha Strongen had was um, to, um, to see if your sisterhood has its own email, not, not where it isn't going to a notification to your email, but if your, does your sisterhood have its own email, Lena, like a, a G, its own Gmail account? That it's, it would be free if you, if you wanted, they, Marcia recommended that, that's what her, her personal um, sisterhood does. And setting it up with Gmail is free. So then, then you would get the notifications would come to that, um, that email. Regardless whether you do set that up, um, well, on the, up where the sisterhood has its own email or not, if your bank has Zelle and you set it up so, you know, it definitely will not have um, your um, sisterhood account connected to your cell phone, then you're safe. And should there ever be a problem, Women's League would offer advice and stand with you because you use Zelle and payments are tied directly to the sisterhood's account. And there's no hint of impropriety because no person has access to those funds. And that support is a benefit of your per capita dues. The next thing on that list was credit cards. Does anyone accept credit card payments? Do you know? Is that something your treasurer would know and you might not yet know? Yes, okay. So then um, you wanna see what credit card processor they take and, may, and see that they uh, avoid linking that processing platform to a personal cell phone. It's sort of the same thing as we were talking about with Zelle if the bank didn't have Zelle because it's not, it's not secure to use personal information. And beyond that, it's important to track transactions and reconcile the accounts promptly. So you match the transaction and you know what the deposit was for. Um, and I know I get those notifications in my computer and then I print that, um, which comes to the computer, I print that uh, and I have that as the documentation which I put in my file of deposits. Are you with me so far? Is there anybody that has any, any questions, any thoughts further? Wow, I thought the, the sun was going down and I was, I was good here. Okay, so I'm going to share screen, go. Continuing on to the, oh, I have to keep doing it each time. Okay. Um, all right. So this is the next set of best practices. And I particularly want to um, start with the first five uh, approvals, signatories, documentation, bank reconciliations, and your executive team colleagues. So that's one of those, um, do all but the, the last one that's listed there. Approvals. Now we're talking about checks that you write and send or payments that you make with a credit card, preferably a sisterhood credit card, not your personal credit card. For both of these, you get the approval of your president that's documented on a signed form or an email. 
Do you know if you have a form that the president can sign? Do you know that uh, one way or the other? Um, you might, might check with your, your treasurer. Um, um, it's not essential that you have the form. You can also, it can also be done by email, which is very helpful if the president and the uh, person needing the, the treasurer needing the approval don't live very close to each other. Um, like I'm in Pennsylvania and Marsha Wasserman's in New Jersey. So I get my approval by email and my email request to her for approval includes who the payee is, the name, the reason for the payment to that person, the amount, and that I've either reviewed the receipts that are uh, for which they're requesting reimbursement or that I have a, an invoice. And then Marsh sends her approval as a return email on top of, of all of that information that I sent her. And then I just print that and that's my documentation. If you also have a form, which I also do, the form can have all of those same fields, but also have a place for the check date and the check number and the budget item that, con that connects to the annual budget. Any questions so far? No, okay. I know it's a lot of information, especially if some of these tasks are done by um, the treasurer who is not here, but you're carrying that information as a wonderful ambassador to her tonight. Signatories. It's important that there be two signers on every check that is written. You wanna arrange for at least three potential signers, usually including you and the treasurer, the fiscal officers, the president is another possibility, um, uh, usually included. Um, and as a safety sake, in case somebody is out of town or two people out of town, another officer or two from your board. You wanna make sure when the checks are written, they are not pre-signed. Oh, hi, Adele, welcome. Welcome, so glad you came. But I'm not sure this is the right session. I'm a data manager. Yeah, for data managers. Yes, I am. Um, it's, uh, I am co-presenting with Beth Chernoff, who will handle both data management and membership. Okay, and we're okay. getting. We're, uh, so we're getting. So you're definitely welcome and and in the right place. Okay, so um, with having um, at least three signatories but maybe more if you like, then um, you have some options to get um, the two signatures and you don't have the checks pre-signed because the second signer should be able to see if the check is correctly made out. I try to make all my checks correctly, um, but there are times I forgot to put the date in, okay? And, um, um, I don't want to send out an incorrectly um, made out check. And so having a second signer is a great, a great help. Like with any kind of thing you want to do in editing. Documentation. So you keep the copies of the checks that you write and that gets sta stapled to the reimbursement request or the invoice that you received, as well as that approval, either email and or form from the president. And that gets put together all as one unit and goes into your file of disbursements. So you have a file of disbursements, as well as uh, we spoke about, or I spoke about earlier, the file of deposits for each fiscal year. The next one I'm wondering if you know about bank reconciliations. Do any of you do the bank reconciliations? No, you think the treasurer does them? Okay. Um, those would be performed monthly. So you can regularly verify that um, um, what 
the treasurer has in um, recorded maybe from you and also what the bank says um, the funds are, agree. So you wanna have that agreement at the end of the month in terms of what's in the sisterhood account. And you can then, um, you or your treasurer can report to the board what payments were made, um, what um, uh, revenue was received and what transactions have not yet been posted to your bank account. Sometimes um, if after a reimbursement check has been written for one of your members, she may be busy and may not have taken it to the bank. And so it will show up as not having cleared. And so, you know, on, in a quiet moment, very diplomatically, you could ask that she um, deposit the check. So it will be posted to your um, sisterhood's account and that will help clear everything for when the reconciliation happens the next month. You, you make sure it's very, you know, very, very soft, very diplomatic to keep um, very good relations going. As far as your executive team, do you know if anyone um, or the treasurer has had the experience in which one of your colleagues asks that a check be sent in short order? Do you know if that's ever happened? You know, like, can you can you get this check out in, in three days? Um, you know, and the treasurer may know that there are so many steps to follow in best practices to assure strong steward, stewardship of the funds, but you can't assume that all your colleagues will be aware of all that you do. So it's, it's helpful sometimes to give a fuller picture so they understand that you might need a little lead time to provide that payment. I wanna bring up the slide again for a moment to look at um, the, ah. So you see that um, the, in the convention logo, the theme is sisters celebrating together. Convention will lift your spirits and connect you to sisters from near and far who share your values and your hopes for our conservative Jewish community. Convention inspires leaders and gives an inspirational charge to you to bring back to your sisterhood and to others from your sisterhood who attend. So I'm encouraging you to plan to attend. It's the week beginning July 16th, 2023, just about a year from now. And for those of you who are fiscal officers, I have another reason for highlighting convention. It's important to include in your sisterhood's budget some funds to help your president attend. And if there's more funds that your, your sisterhood raises that's available to provide some additional support for others of you who would be interested in attending to help allay some of the uh, registration expenses. In addition, I know that um, you have a question. Jennifer? I do because thank you because it's July. Would that be next year's budget, not right. this coming year's budget for July uh, of twenty twenty three? I recommend. I would that recommend. Be? I, it's it, it's coming up, but I recommend that every year. The sister could allocate some funds to set aside and hold restricted okay. for, um, for a convention to set aside to help the president first, but others in addition, if there are the funds to go. Um, and sometimes if, if there's a change in the leadership, they mm -hmm. may not be aware 
that that's something to do, but you want to um, bring back input from women's league saying it's it's encouraged that we in, that we include in our annual budget some funds to help the president attend. And if there's more funds that we get from fundraisers and we can add to that to help others from our sisterhood. So we go, we um, get stronger and stronger, all of us together. And do you know an approximate number to put aside? Is it like $200 or $500 or do we have an idea of what it would be? Thousand dollars. If you're, asking, what is, if you're yeah. asking and it's each year and it's 500, mm -hmm. then um, that's wonderful. You'll probably be able to help not only your president, but maybe some others who are um, rising and could, you know, some, there's often an issue with leadership transition to make sure mm -hmm. that there's, uh, there's somebody coming up who wants to be president or others who want to be vice presidents and they can get that elect, you know, inspirational charge by going to convention and that helps your sisterhood move forward in the future with a strong back bench, you know, for, for leadership. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to put that there's a cap. It's whatever you can possibly do that would help because that will make such a difference in the future for your, for your sisterhood. And it happens. Okay. Happen thank you. Every year. Sure. Thank you. Great question. Um, I know that in the mid Atlantic region, we have been doing um, uh, fundraisers to um, uh, have, and we have a scholarship fund that um, members um, from every um, affiliate sisterhood in the mid-Atlantic region, the, all the members can, who are interested can apply for some scholarship funds to the region. And in addition at our events, we have some, um, some you know, raffles and so on with some smaller awards that also can be used all um, towards um, um, some registration costs. And um, I think that most of the regions also do something similar. I would recommend that you um, check your, your um, wonderful um, Garden State Treasurer, Cindy Manis would know more. Um, so I do hope that um, you will all try to attend and that I will get to see uh, many of you at our 2023 convention in, in it's Schaumburg, Illinois, just outside Chicago. Are there other questions so far uh, where I've gone with fiscal? Because we're going to take a break from fiscal. I'll come back in a bit and, um, and Beth Chernoff, my colleague who is membership sisterhood support will speak about um, data management and membership. But before we go to that, are there any um, small questions that you might have about what I covered up, to, up so far? Okay, so um, Beth, I, I um, welcome you. Okay, I did that. I think I did that. Everybody sees a nice screen with Matilda Schechter. Hello? I don't hear any yes. sound. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes we you. can see it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ariana. I've been asked and I shall cut right to the chase. The $15 per capita remains the same this year as it has for a good many years. Um, have you ever been asked, where does my $15 go? What does it do for me? Maybe you yourself have asked that question. One way to answer is to direct your curious friend to the Women's League website, or better yet, to explore the website together. You will be amazed at the wealth of offerings. And here is the link. And when I do that, do, I, do you see a cursor? Okay, thank you. All right, this is what the top of the homepage looks like. The picture changes, this picture changes every few seconds. So you might see a reminder to buy the calendar diary or learn about Torah Fund or subscribe to the YouTube channel. Of course, this is a snapshot, so it's not 
going to change. But what I'd like to show you are these small headings, these four small headings near the top about member services, programs, and resources. Let's start with programs. <clears throat> if you click on programs, all of these links appear. Programming idea of the week, an idea uh, a week going back to September 2020, wellness and learning materials, women's leak reads, and you can click to listen to a book discussion that you may have missed. Program showcase, other sisterhoods share their successful ideas and much more. Now, if I click on Women's League program and wet programs and webinars, I have access to recorded programs and here they are. But if I log into the members only section of the site, I have access to much more. And this is not even half of the topics available. You can learn Hebrew by logging into the recorded classes. You can go back and revisit the Magnificent Conference from Convention 2020. And you can be among the first to get the sneak peek of the logo for Convention 2023, which Ariana introduced. There it is. And are you starting to get a feel for the benefits of membership? In addition to archived items and recordings for you to enjoy, there are social causes you can connect with and leadership training and opportunities to meet Israeli counterparts. There are dozens and dozens of links. There are programming ideas to bring back to your own affiliate and scripts and resources. No need to reinvent the wheel. And there are sections just for leadership where you'll get advice on writing bylaws and creating policy, such as whether non-Jews may join your affiliate. And incidentally, Women's League's new bylaws approved just last month now state that anyone identifying as a woman may join. You'll be amazed to discover that you can view the website in 104 languages, everything from Afrikaans to Zulu, because of course we are an international organization with a reach as far as Uganda. This screen reminds you to purchase your calendar diary for 57.83. Here we're being told to read the weekly newsletter. <laughs> That's Hebrew. And here we're being told in the Mamalushan, Yiddish, to subscribe to, to Women's League's YouTube channel to view past programs. This is YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> and this is record, I don't know how to say it, but it's recording, recordings, okay. Um, incidentally, if your name is on the website, you can see how to write it in every language. Matilda would be gobsmacked. And now we pivot to the database, also found on the Women's League website. Four positions and four positions only have access to the membership database. They are presidents, treasurers, financial secretaries, and data managers. If your membership VP is going to make updates for your affiliate, then she must also be made a data manager to have access. I cannot show you a screenshot of the database for privacy reasons, but if you have access, you can update position holders using the manage positions option, and you can update membership using the, mem the manage member list option. If you've never logged in before, you would click login on the home page and create a password. Once a position has been updated, you will see the member management area where when, whenever you log into the website, where you can update membership lists and position lists. Please note that all positions must be updated every year. Positions do not roll over automatically. The database is pretty user-friendly and intuitive. Now, we're not going to learn it here, but there are several ways you can learn it. 
takes like five minutes. Raisa Kessler in the New York office is a wonderful resource. She would be happy to train anyone. I have been trained by Razel and I am also available to anyone in your affiliate who needs help. Or there are directions you can view on the website under resources for sisterhood presidents. In the coming days, I will be sending out an, an email attachment with the directions from the website. But if you want to make sure you get it, please email me and you'll have it tonight. Here are some final points, final thoughts. If you are offering free membership to people, such as your rabbi or your rabbi's wife or your executive director, you must still add their name to the database and calculate the per capita payment. Per capita to Women's League should come from dues, not fundraising. If your affiliate is experiencing some challenges, you can request what we call a variance. Several affiliates were bold enough to come forward and request a variance. And now they are back on their feet and self-sustaining. That's the goal. We understand that some affiliates have special situations, especially lately. Please let us know so we can help. And that is something that would be handled at the international, not the region level. And finally, take advantage of all your per capita entitles you to. This includes access to a consultant available to you every year to help you with issues you're experiencing or to be a guest speaker, whatever you wish. This is a benefit of your membership and we urge you to make use of it. Ariana and I are always available for your questions. We want you to be successful in your role and for your sisterhood to thrive. Thank you. And I think we are, we should probably be getting notified that we are going into the uh, main group. Is that correct, uh, Barb? Pretty soon. So if everybody so on questions, no questions. Already. Yes, want want to take questions, Idell. So um, my primary reason for coming is because I'm the data manager in two sisterhoods. I can only get access to one sisterhood. Uh, I think they told me that I had access to both, but I can't find the access to the second one. So how does that work? Thank you, Idell. I researched this question ahead of time. Um, the system will only recognize one email address and one password. You can't have two email addresses, even if you did have two emails. You can have two emails and you, oh, it's going to close. And you can't um, have two passwords. I'd like to thank everybody for coming back <laughs> and staying <laughs> with us. Karen and I want to thank our committee members, Marsha Wasserman, our leader, Shelly Swibenes, Ariana Barrows, <coughs> excuse me, Barbara Shirovsky. Debbie Zimmerman, Beth Chernoff, Roberta Gordon, and Lori Snow, our immediate past president and mentor, as well as our region consultant, Margie Miller, for all of your assistance getting this program together. Thank you also, Karen Bellina, for your expert te technical expertise. Without you, these boomers would be lost in cyberspace or in the cloud. We are honored to have among us many of our region past presidents and women's league dignitaries, thank you for attending. If your sisterhood aff affiliate is not technically part of the Mid-Atlantic region, please make every effort to contact your region's executive team for further assistance. That said, we always love to network and share ideas with other sisters. We are looking to think outside the box and interacting with our sisters from other regions will spark some ideas for programs that we can tailor to our specific needs. Please look for a brief program evaluation in your email. Your responses will help us to prepare for future programs. Now for the important things. If you have any complaints about the refreshments that you consume during this program, please go to the market before the next Zoom meeting 
or be sure to have my friends, Ben and Jerry, residing in your freezer at all times. Be careful navigating away from your computer. Stay safe. Do not pick up any strangers on your way to another room. I want to thank everybody for coming. I had a wonderful time planning this with our committee and especially, of course, with Karen. And um, I hope to see you again next year. But before that, a happy and healthy new year and look for our programs and support our programs from both both our region and Women's League. Thank you.